Uh, good evening to everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the June 20th, 2017 TIF workshop, and TIF stands for Tax Increment Financing. Uh, we have a lot of people here from the school district and other organizations. So at this point, I will turn it over to Ellen Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for everybody uh, joining us this evening on tax increment financing. It's kind of a, a learning experience for everybody. We're going to have a number of speakers talk about some of those uh, parts of a tax increment finance uh, district plan. Uh, we have people uh, here on kind of specialties that they do. Uh, we have Ellers and Associates who can talk about TIF and uh, rates of return and pro formas and things of that nature. Uh, we also have Darren and uh, Burrich and Kelly Nyforth. They'll talk about TIFs in Wisconsin and TIFs in Oshkosh, a little history. And Jason White will talk about uh, tax increment financing and economic development. And then Mr. Roloff and I want to talk about some of the policy decisions uh, that the uh, community, the city, uh, the council uh, have considered in the past. And we've changed a lot of things as time has gone by, but there's always ways to improve the system. So there's a number of ideas that we have regarding TIF policy that uh, we can start you thinking about. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, ask for introductions around the table just so everybody knows who everybody is, if that would be okay with everyone. Alan Davis, Community Development Director. I'm John Cameron. I'm a Municipal Advisor with Ellers & Associates. Mark Roloff, City Manager. Uh, David Borsick, Plan Commission. Lori Palmieri, Common Council. Jake Krause, Common Council. Caroline Pansky, City Council. Steve Herman, City Council. John Kiefer, Planning Commission. Tom Peck, Common Council. Steve Cummings, Mayor. Stephanie Carlin, School District. Deborah L. Snosby, Common Council. Thank you. And then I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Cameron for the TIF and how does it work? Kind of a TIF. Remind everybody how it works. Great. Excellent. So thank you, everyone. Um, I am going to just do the. Uh, the TIF 101 portion. So to start off just at the very basic level, what is tax incremental financing? At its core, it's an economic development financing tool, and it's really the most uh, crucial uh, economic development financing tool that municipalities have uh, in their toolbox. Um, and essentially, uh, the community undertakes a project or projects uh, that are specified in a project plan uh, to attract and facilitate development or uh, redevelopment. And they can include uh, the installation or rehab of uh, infrastructure, uh, hard infrastructure costs, uh, the acquisition of land, and then the payment of development incentives as well. And we'll talk about those, uh, uh, all three of these items, uh, a little bit more in depth on the next few slides. Uh, essentially, then, the investment that the community makes uh, within these projects is repaid over time uh, by capturing the increased uh, property tax revenue that is generated uh, within the district. So before I you know, go further and, and show graphically how that works, um, I think it's, it's key to talk about uh, some of the acronyms here, uh, TIF and TID. Uh, those are two different things that are, are talked about. Uh, the TIF is the actual uh, tool. It uh, stands for Tax Incremental Financing, so it is the actual mechanism itself. TID, or Tax Increment District, is the physical boundary in terms of where the tax incremental financing is uh, occurring. So when you talk about a TIF uh, district or a TID, the TID itself is the physical boundary of where uh, the uh, projects are occurring. So to show you kind of graphically how uh, the uh, a TIF district works, kind of going from left to right on the uh, screen, the first step in the process is that the boundary of the TID um, is established. So in this case, uh, it's a you know, kind of a simplistic type example, um, but we've got eight different parcels. Uh, they have to be contiguous in nature, uh, so you can't you know, go from one block to the next and pick out parcels. The parcels themselves have to be contiguous, and it has to also include the whole parcel itself. Uh, so in this example, there are eight different parcels that would make up the uh, physical boundary of the uh, TIF district, so that's the TID. 
uh, those parcels have a value. The value itself uh, at the time the district is created is called the base value and it is shown in blue on the chart uh, in the middle of the page. The base value in this uh, example is at $2 million. Um, so that value is frozen uh, for the life of the district. Any appreciation is added to the red portion in terms of increment. So uh, if you look at the far right hand side of the screen, the blue pie chart uh, on the bottom, um, so within the base value, all of the taxing jurisdictions will continue to receive their share of the tax levy on the equalized value of that base at $2 million. So in this case uh, of our example, our, our tax rate is $20 uh, per thousand, and you can uh, see how that's broken out. So the municipal tax rate would be $6.50. In this example, the county's rate is $4, school is at $7.50, and the uh, technical college is at two. Now this is just an, an example. Um, so the base value uh, will continue to be taxed at those different uh, tax rates. The increment, so as these properties uh, develop or redevelop over time, uh, the amount of value, in this case going from two million up to eight million, uh, almost nine million by the time uh, the district is retired, uh, the TID will receive the taxes on the incremental equalized value uh, at the combined rate of all taxing entities at that $20 per thousand. So, and that, and that incremental uh, uh, value as it comes in goes to pay off costs within project costs within the district itself. So that is the real value of the TID. Some of the basic rules for uh, establishing the TID, uh, the, really the critical rule is what's called the but-for test, and it's established uh, via state statutes, and um, it's but-for the use of TID, uh, the proposed development would not necessarily not occur at all, but not occur either as proposed, really within the same time frame that you would like to see, and within the same level of value that you would expect to see uh, within that, that site or within the district boundaries itself. Uh, and really the Joint Review Board, uh, which is a five-member board <coughs> uh, consisting of all of the different taxing uh, jurisdictions uh, within the district, must make a but-for finding uh, before the TID creation process uh, can occur. And that is spelled out again in the project plan and then one of the uh, key responsibilities of the Joint Review Board is to make that but for finding. John, the, the three as proposed same time frames, mm -hmm. it can be one, it can be two, it can be That's correct. all of them. It, That's correct. It's not a matter of check, check, it's, check. It's not, right, it's not an all-inclusive uh, all inclusive list. Um, in terms of the rules itself, there, when, when the district is created, it falls into one, really one of these four different buckets for the type of district that it will be. Uh, the type of district that it will be uh, dictates the maximum life as well as the type of development uh, that you would expect to see within the district. Um, the four different types of districts, so again, as at the time that the district is brought forward, it's designated as one of these four types. Uh, mixed use, industrial, blighted, or the final one is conservation or rehabilitation district. The mixed use and industrial districts both have 20 year maximum lives. The blighted or conservation or rehab districts have a maximum life under the statutes of 27 years. And under the rules, at least 50% of the proposed district area uh, within, within those boundaries has to be for mixed use suitable for a combination of uh, industrial, commercial, uh, and residential uses. Um, the industrial would be zoned and suitable for industrial development. Uh, blighted is, is blighted uh, under uh, Wisconsin state statutes. And then conservation or rehab would be also defined uh, as conservation or rehabilitation type items as defined under 
uh, state statutes. Uh, the other item that's key uh, in terms of newly platted residential development is that only a mixed use uh, district allows uh, newly platted residential development to occur within it uh, with a maximum of 35% of the total area of the district uh, that can be uh, uh, allowed to, to occur within uh, as residential development. Before you move on. Yes. Um, so the max life here are um, the statutory max life at the state level. Um, but that does not mean that our locality can't set lower maximums, correct? Other municipalities do that, is that correct? Correct, this is the, the maximum <laughs> life that you see here is, is via the state statute. Thank you. In terms of the uh, expenditure period, so the each uh, district has a maximum time period that uh, you can incur uh, expenses related to the project plan and essentially it's five years shorter than the uh, maximum unextended life so 15 years for uh, uh, mixed use or industrial TID and 22 years for um, you know conservation or a blight district uh, with a 27 year life uh, so that's the time period to make hard <coughs> expenditures there are certain payments that can extend beyond the expenditure period um, uh, one of the best examples would be uh, project uh, payments of uh, debt service on project costs that, that occur prior to the maximum life period. So if you were to take out debt, say, in the fifth year of the district um, and, and have that debt be repaid over a 15-year period, uh, you could take that debt out to the, you know, to the maximum life of the uh, uh, district under, under state statute. Um, the other item would be repayment of any advances uh, or uh, development incentives as well. Um, and then finally, um, I'm going to talk about eligible project costs. So under state statutes, uh, the list that you see here are the items that are allowable uh, as project costs within uh, specified within the project plan. Uh, to be TIF eligible. Um, certainly you have your public works, your hard uh, uh, public works type costs and improvements, sewer, storm, uh, road type, type projects, uh, as well as financing related costs that might go along with <coughs> say uh, issuing debt for those types of improvements. Um, there's property uh, assembly costs, essentially land write down type costs that are eligible. Uh, professional service type costs as well as administrative costs that can be charged to the <coughs> district uh, on an annual basis, um, a contribution to a community development authority, a redevelopment authority, uh, relocation type costs um, uh, as well as organizational costs, um, uh, utility infrastructure costs are certainly an eligible type cost. Uh, cash grants uh, incentive or, or what are called development incentives are also eligible. Uh, however, that does under statute require a development agreement to occur. Uh, environmental remediation and then project costs that are within a half mile uh, radius of the district are also uh, eligible provided that you can demonstrate uh, the benefit to the uh, district. That would, you, what, would you mostly say that's like your sewer, road, sidewalks, those hard, yes. hard Yes, uh, signage would be another one uh, that, uh, that, that would be an eligible type cost depending on, you know, the type of district. Uh, that's, that's another item as well, but yes, generally speaking. On the financing costs, so if there is an assumption in the project plan that the, that the developer is going to have like a 5.75% um, interest, but in fact later they're able to I don't know, say get four and a quarter. Um, that would no longer be a cost, correct? Because it's less. So is there, I guess, is there a capture mechanism if that financing cost gets negotiated down, being that it didn't actually cost that much in the interest. Sure. I mean, in, in general, when you when the project plan is put forward, and, and in many cases, the uh, plan itself are estimates of costs sure. that may incur. Absolutely. And if the costs come in less than that, I mean, it's really based on the, uh, the overall cash flow of the district in terms of the amount of tax increment available relative to the actual costs that 
um, are, are paid off. So if the costs come in less, uh, the district itself can recover its project costs that much faster than what was originally proposed in the, in the project plan. So with that, I'll okay. turn it back. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Sure. Thank you. I think Mr. Bike is here and I have an additional handout. If I were to give that to the you want me to go here? Yeah. Someone set up. <coughs> yep, that's the one you should have gotten, didn't I? Everybody got that. That's good. Except you. Just me. Good. Okay. Uh, introduction yep my name is Jason white I serve as the CEO of the greater Oshkosh economic development corporation uh, I've been in this role for a couple of years and um, one of the things I just wanted to say too is um, I want to credit both the council and the staff for bringing this together tonight um, this is the fourth organization that I've worked for and it always seems like TIF while it's one of the more powerful tools available at the local level is also a lot of times the most confusing tool uh, as well and uh, you know even me coming over here from another state uh, over the last 15 years and uh, all the different organizations that hasn't changed at all uh, so uh, I think approximately 45 to 49 states have tax increment financing and they all have it set up a little bit differently so coming over here um, I've even had to spend some time understanding how Wisconsin administers TIF. So that's done, definitely been, a, been an eye-opener for me as well. So the purpose of this presentation is to do a couple things. Um, we're gonna go through a little bit of an Economic Development 101, but not a complete Economic Development 101 because there's about a half a dozen speakers behind me. And this would be about a four-hour presentation if we truly do an Economic Development 101. Um, and I think we um, also wanna talk a little bit about um, how other tools are used uh, in other communities and some of those tools Oshkosh does not have when it comes to economic development right now and also some examples I think we can learn a lot from examples and what other communities are doing and how they use TIF so we're gonna hit a couple of those things but um, I think the most important thing and, and I like I said I've, I can't stress this enough is to look at the literature that organizations put out as to how TIF is explained and used as a viable economic development tool and I certainly have, have done that as well um, first off when it comes to um, let me grab that it might be easier if I do it when it comes to economic development um, there's a variety of different definitions even the International Economic Development Council describes economic development pretty generally but most definitions of economic development are going to describe it in terms of jobs wealth creation and supporting quality of life and certainly the International Economic Development Council does that um, just a little bit about my background um, I got my start actually working for a city in economic development when I was at the University of Iowa um, in their master's program for urban and regional planning and so I kind of got both ends of it early in my career where I was in, co in class with very skeptical uh, professors of TIF uh, but at the same time I was working for the city of Coralville which probably at that time was the most aggressive uh, community in the state in terms of utilizing uh, TIF for economic development so I really got a good baptism by fire at that point which is a good prelude I think to the rest of my career in terms of this tug of war when it comes to TIF but I think um, <laughs> one of the experiences I had was working for uh, the late Dr. David Forkenbrock who also had his own definition of um, economic development which also described it in a more broad sense and not just in a monetary perspective but also in terms of the environmental amenities and the quality of life factors that are involved with economic development as well and finally just a, a quick descriptor in terms of um, my role in the economic development process and that is I think described very well by somebody I used to work with and uh, Debbie Durham who described it the role of an economic developer is to protect the growth vision of a community and I think uh, I can pr very much appreciate the role that you have uh, as decision makers of this community because you weigh a lot of different factors when you ultimately make your decisions and set policy for the community but in terms of our role 
<coughs> all we do is eat, breathe, and sleep economic development. So we're always bringing that perspective to the table uh, with economic development and also with tax increment financing. So what does economic, why does economic development require organization? A lot of folks will assume that economic development just occurs naturally. Um, businesses will come if they, if they want to come. They won't come if they don't want to come. But there's a lot of uh, influencing factors that go into that. One of it is there's a lot of competition. There's thousands of people like me um, out there that are competing for business investments every day. So we look at what we do from a competitive sense and trying to position our community to compete for high value, high paying, high growth opportunities. And from that sense too, in terms of our public private uh, liaison role, uh, we really want to create a community where developers uh, will desire our community uh, because they have professionals that can uh, help them understand their objectives, the objectives of the community, and help guide them through the development process. Uh, we really believe that the communities that are best prepared and best understand uh, the business climate of their community will be the ones that will ultimately win when it comes to economic development deals. A lot of times I'll work with an existing business uh, that, you know, an existing business, you know, they might expand three times in the course of their life. And, you know, they're in the business of dealing with customers and suppliers and uh, how they're going to run their business on a day-to-day -day basis. And so when they decide to ultimately expand, this is what the process can feel like to them. So um, I always appreciate it from their perspective that um, this process of economic development can be very intimidating of all the different factors that they have to work through from permitting to um, incentives to financing to workforce um, so definitely appreciate in standing in their shoes uh, when we have an opportunity to help somebody through the process and ultimately we want them to feel like this that they're busting through the dam at the end of the process that they've been able to get everything together that they need to continue to grow their company. I think it's also important to know that um, economic development is very much a team game and that, you know, in this seat, we will work with anybody and everybody uh, when it comes to helping each incremental step along the way. So um, you can see all the different stakeholders involved, at least on this slide, that are involved in ultimately putting a deal together. And at some point or another, all of these organizations in this slide and many others will play a role in that, in that business's or that uh, investor's or developer's success. So incentives. Incentives are um, not always perceived real positively uh, out in the public because it, a lot of times it involves the extension of uh, public resources in some way. Uh, but these public resources can play a very big factor in whether or not the deal ultimately happens and also influencing where that deal ultimately may, may, uh, may go. Um, and certainly we've seen that in how Oshkosh has utilized incentives. And it can come in various forms, whether, it's, whether it be direct cash assistance, tax exemptions or credits, uh, workforce training, public infrastructure improvements, all different types of incentives that you are all very familiar with. And I think it's also important to say, too, uh, somebody told me once very early in my career that incentives do not make a bad deal good, that can only make a good deal better. They can really only serve as a tipping point for whether or not that investment occurs. <coughs> kind of going back to uh, the earlier speaker of the but for analysis uh, and, and how incentives can, can play a role in furthering the deal. And one of the best ways, I think, to attract investment that I've seen is for other developers, for other business businesses to witness other developers and other businesses making money and finding success in our community. We want businesses, we want developers to make money and be successful here. And I think sometimes uh, that can be a forgotten factor and that's very important. <coughs> well, I have a duplicate slide here, which I apologize for. Um, so I'm going to skip this one. 
We go right on to other communities. Other communities, I define other communities by my experiences, my past experiences in other communities, which of course, as we know, are largely in another state. But some of the experiences I've had um, in comparison to Oshkosh is some of these communities utilize TIF more broadly. Um, they're more open to using that, using TIF for uh, retail, commercial, and industrial, and some, in many cases, housing projects. Um, they're both used as an upfront direct uh, incentives uh, based on a performance pledge, which is also uh, a lot of times involves a clawback. So those performance measures aren't met, then the company actually ends up paying back the incentive for not achieving those uh, performance benchmarks. And also as a rebate uh, on the back end, which is a term we actually used in Iowa, uh, but it essentially is uh, with equivalent to the pay go that you have here. I'm told that you can't use the word rebate in the state of Wisconsin legally, so that's the last time you'll probably hear me use that word in the course of this presentation. Um, TIF policies, in, in, in many cases, are more guidelines in communities, confirm principles, in, in that offering the municipality some flexibility for a deal to be supported uh, if it has a certain level of community impact that that community wants to support. In many of these communities, um, there are other tools that can also be brought to the fore, uh, tools such as property tax abatement, uh, property tax exemption, exemption in lieu of TIF <coughs> or in addition to TIF. The Wisconsin's Constitution does not allow uh, property tax exemption or property tax abatement, as I understand. Many counties, even in Wisconsin, um, have an extra sales tax that they are used, able to use to also help projects. Fond du Lac County, for example, uh, has been able to use uh, the sales tax to uh, help companies like Mercury Marine and also uh, Alliance Laundry uh, stay and also expand in their community, which Winnebago County does not have. So it really puts a lot of um, attention to tax increment financing as it relates to Oshkosh uh, assisted projects uh, in economic development. So Oshkosh's approach to TIF, uh, in terms of how I've observed it to date, uh, just in my couple years, is obviously you've used it for a lot of redevelopment investments, for high impact projects, um, rather than uh, projects that are further away from your downtown. Um, project debates that I've seen from the council is um, a lot of times you will focus on the ROI and the return that investor and that developer achieves in addition to simply the return that the community uh, receives from that project. Um, the policy does not weigh very as strongly as I would recommend anyway in terms of assistance to companies that create high paying jobs uh, or create major economic impact again from away, the, from, uh, away from the city center and utilize largely pay go TIFs um, due to a lot of different factors, uh, largely because of budgetary uh, reasons, but obviously a lot of projects in Oshkosh have benefited from that, that you have supported. A couple of different examples, um, as I always forget to switch the slide, um, is one community I think that you could look to that's most similar that I have found to how Oshkosh has attempted to use TIF and that is the city of Denver. And I have found that they use a very strict return on investment model, which um, has also helped their TIFs achieve a higher level of return on investment. And that is retire requiring uh, developers to um, look at the sources and uses of their funds, uh, operating pro forma, verification of developer assumptions, comparative financing rates and availability, independent market studies, and a termination of their net reasonable return. Uh, they even go as far as um, initiating um, a master uh, developer for their master planning for their large scale partnerships, uh, which has also helped them achieve a level of 140% return on their 26 TIFs over the last couple of decades. So if you're looking for some uh, comparative example of how Oshkosh can look to another community in terms of how you've used it most similarly, I'd recommend looking at the city of Denver. I'd also want to point out a couple of different examples of how um, I've used TIF in a couple of different projects with our decision makers where I came from. Um, and again, with a different set of TIF um, 
uh, principles and also tools that we had at our disposal. And that is uh, one with um, the city of Coralville, which is where I started my career, probably most similar to the Sawdust District, where they had a district called the um, Iowa River Landing uh, Reinvestment District, which was a 180 district, uh, acre area with 75 landowners. Um, they've used uh, TIF for a variety of different things, uh, but they've also attracted a variety of different mixed use um, opportunities uh, to that district and have also um, incorporated some environmental and sustainable principles uh, with their uh, TIF uh, redevelopment uh, uh, projects in that area as well. Um, and then most recently, where I came from in Warren County, the uh, city of Car uh, Carlisle, a uh, community of about 4,000 people, did not have a grocery store. They were a suburban community to Des Moines. And they utilized TIF. Um, this is one of those examples where they wouldn't probably use it in this way to attract any kind of retail or service business, but they did in the name of uh, supporting a very important need in their community, which is to feed their, their population. Uh, and in this case, uh, they did a 20-year TIF, um, a $300,000 uh, grant from the city, from the county, and also a $145,000 loan from the county to the city to, uh, to help further that deal. And then lastly, the city of Norwalk, uh, which attracted a, a uh, processing slash distribution uh, facility uh, with 145 jobs that they were um, attracted to their community in a 100,000 square foot building where they did a multi-year TIF, an $830,000 grant, $159,000 uh, rebate uh, to pay them back on land that they purchased from the city, and then also um, $100,000, $130,000 grant they received from the county to help on some in infrastructure improvements. And you can see how that deal came together here in this slide with respect to project costs, which is a $7.1 million project. They received one point, roughly $1.2 million in local incentives in the form of property tax uh, exemption, uh, tax increment financing, a city land grant, and a county grant to go along with a $400,000 tax credit they received from the state. So with all that being said, a couple of different um, recommendations that I would have is to consider uh, looking at utilizing TIF from a job creation perspective uh, as much as a redevelopment perspective. And when I say job creation, looking at opportunities that may arise in the business parks of Oshkosh along the I-41 corridor, um, looking at it as a way to, as an overall part of the picture to attract a series of deals setting up the next series of deals. Um, you know, I always say success breeds success. Right now, Oshkosh has a lot of momentum. We don't want to lose that momentum. Once the momentum is lost, it's hard to regain. And uh, certainly as a community, uh, we have busted down that dam, so to speak. Um, and so we don't want to become a community where we're pushing the boulder up the hill. And I think right now we have a lot of opportunities and with TIF, I think we have a lot more opportunities. And if we continue to look at expanding the different ways that we might be able to look at uh, supporting projects in our community. Um, one other quick note I want to mention, and um, I was reading uh, this guide here. It's called Efficient and Strategic Use of TIF, a guide for Wisconsin municipalities put out by the Center of Wisconsin uh, Strategy. Uh, which I was reading a little bit, and I think there's some real innovative ideas also in that guide uh, that uh, our community can look at in terms of utilizing it for um, environmental purposes and also for job training, which right now we have a real issue in terms of we need more uh, people in our community to fill the jobs that we have. So um, in terms of TIF applications and considering points, um, I would consider, uh, encourage Oshkosh to also look at some of those innovative uses as well. So, so I'm going to conclude there. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Jason? Otherwise, I'm going to ask Kelly to come up to talk about how TIF has been used in Wisconsin. Uh, last 
city council meeting when we talked about this, a number of council members asked us to kind of do a little survey of the state to figure out what else is going on in other communities. Uh, and Kelly Nyforth, our economic development services manager, and uh, Everett uh, in our economic development tech worked on uh, putting this information together in the last week or so so that we can give you a comparison and Kelly's going to go over what we found in looking in the valley and looking in the state of Wisconsin. Sure so we looked at um, to start off with we looked at three or neighboring communities um, in the PowerPoint here um, I'll, I'll start with the slideshow. Um, first, we looked at um, some of the recent uh, projects that had a t obtained TIF um, financing uh, for their development. So the first one we had looked at was Menasha. And as you see, this is that um, office building in their downtown area. Um, and throughout the whole process, we looked at a lot of communities. Did they have a TIF application? Did they have a TIF policy? Um, you know, trying to somewhat compare to see where we rank and overall, Oshkosh we saw was much more sophisticated as, through the TIF process than other communities are. So you'll see a few notes in the PowerPoint here where um, we note if there was no TIF policy or no TIF application. Um, so just a few highlights of the um, Anasha TID number 13. Um, it was a blighted TIF and um, it was a somewhat you could maybe compare it to the city center um, it was a pago and it was a um, so there were some upfront costs um, that the city contributed right away and um, it was a multi-story office tower with 300 and plus employees and um, they had requested assistance from the city for land assembly costs costs associated with building and then um, parking ramp so um, as you see, oh, let me get the <coughs> clicker here. Oh, thanks. Um, the city is doing some right away improvements um, to help so utilities and also um, a little bit with the parking. So it was a pretty substantial project. Um, you see the performance incentive, incentives are up to $7.9 million. Uh, there was an upfront um, payment that the developer received and they actually had amended an existing TID to use that money to give a 750000 to um, upfront right away. And then there was a clause in the development agreement saying um, a year after the construction has started, they have to give the developer another $1 million. And then as you see, through 2017 through 2041, 95% of the increment um, goes to the developer up to that $7.9 million figure. Kelly, do you happen to know um, what Menasha's TIF utilization rate is, what their percentage is? Um, I don't know that offhand. I might, I, I may have it in my folder over there, but I'll, we'll, we'll get that information. Um, next, looking at Appleton. Um, Appleton, if you remember, like Oshkosh, uh, wanted to do some redevelopment along the riverfront. The Eagle Flats is in their riverfront area. Um, they had created this TID, the city did on their own in 2009, and they finally, a developer um, came by in the past couple years, so this TIF, the developer agreement was created in 2016. Um, once again, Appleton has no formal TIF policy or application. Um, it was a blighted area type of uh, TID also. Um, in this project, the developer bought land from the Appleton RDA, and um, then there's two different phases as far as senior living and then single family and then condos. So kind of a two-prong approach. This is a PAYGO though, and um, in it, as you see, payments should not be over $4.2 million, and um, city will pay 90% of the tax revenue um, for the full 27 years. And I believe Appleton, um, according to this, my from this year, they're like at a 3.4% utilization rate. Yep, I think so they're pretty right. selective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I believe they've also had some duds too. Yeah, and just looking at maps um, of the different, um, the boundaries of the different TIF districts in the um, Northeast Wisconsin, theirs are much broader than this, um, what the city of Oshkosh has been doing lately as far as single parcel. Um, you know, they, they encompass Green Bay and Appleton. Yes. We looked and it is a pretty big difference. So, um, so yeah, but they are, you're right, pretty selective. Uh, looking ahead then to uh, 
Oh, there's just a picture of it. You can kind of see it's very nice development and it's they're up and running. Uh, the Nina, um, they had another office building in their downtown. Um, Plexus was moving in and they have a few other users. Um, this was also a blight. Um, TID, again, no formal TIF policy or application for the city of Nina. Um, and this was a um, kind of a combination of uh, the city um, coming through with um, providing parking spots for the office building and then um, giving them some land for a dollar that the RDA owns. Um, as you see, the developer, the cost that they're paying to the developer is much lower, but the city does have to um, pay for the parking um, that is required per the development agreement. So this TIF, as you see, the um, agreement is for a shorter amount of time. It ends in 2023, but as you see, the amount of money is a lot lower. So part of the incentive, you see the city of Nina is required to um, provide parking lots and then do some other right-of-way improvements. Any idea on what? cost of the parking lots are that was not in the development agreement um, you know my guess is they're probably using some of the TIF money for that to pay for that improvement as well really was there any private money involved in this at all yes yep the construction cost was six million dollars for the office building and so I mean the developer was is getting four hundred and twenty thousand dollars from the TIF, and then um, obviously the city also has to pay for some parking, but uh, for the construction of the building, and then there was some land acquisition that the developer also had to um, complete. So what did they put in for equity? Um, I would have to look at the development agreement. And then, so is that max 70% of the increment, is that Nina's policy overall, or just I think it's just case by case. They do not have a set policy. And they're at a 9.1, so they're pretty high. Sure. Yep. Was, was this the project that also include the buyback of the existing Plexix office building? Um, I don't, was that financed in this? That, that was not financed. Really. That was between private parties. <coughs> that was what so. I was trying to get. There was some private right negotiations right um, but as far as the city's role with the TID I mean this is what you know was in the agreement so um, and then we just have kind of uh, and I believe that in the past couple weeks that it has opened up and I think they had a grand opening I saw um, So five years that's a pretty short time yeah um, the, the only thing to you know we, we don't have access to all of their files as far as you know we, we did a lot of digging on websites and contacting city officials but we're not sure how much the city is taking out the TIF to help pay for those parking lots so there might be other costs associated besides that four hundred and twenty thousand dollars that you know we see in the development agreement um, but that would be something you know we could we could follow up on and see if there's more detailed oh, so you're costs. Saying they might have done some initial like geo bond type things in combination with this. I'm, yeah, it's okay. for revenue bonds potentially. It, for revenue bonds. Probably the general point that you you can take away from this is that every project has some unique features, and when you're at mm -hmm. the table trying to problem solve a, a project like this, ideas are just going to be just coming out and. This was a this was a good project for the city of Nina. It doesn't necessarily translate. We should do exactly what they did because you don't necessarily need to do those things in some cases. In other cases, you need to do more. It really depends on what the situation is. Um, Nina obviously is very aggressive because they 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 use this quite a bit, and you see it in their in their downtown area. Right. And then uh, the handout that Darren had handed out before um, I started discussing this. This was actually um, a study that was done. I don't want to say a study. It was just um, a survey. Yeah, a survey that the City of La Crosse staff um, they contacted quite a few municipalities across the state of Wisconsin and asked all these same questions. So it really is a, a nice breakdown of. And unfortunately, more people didn't respond, but it still gives you a, a flavor of what other communities, municipalities in the state um, are doing. You know, talking about the TIF policy and then talking about what types of projects that um, communities generally allow. Um, a lot of times you'll see it says case by case. So as Mark was talking about, it really, you know, each project is unique when it comes forward. Um, but, you know, we don't have to go through everything here, but 
um, please read over it because it is a lot of inf interesting information as far as you know what they other municipalities look for and what they allow in their communities is that done do you know it was done earlier this year in february so it's i'd say it's pretty recent and i think i mean they do it every couple of years i think you had said you've been contacted before so um it's something we would probably try to keep up with and maybe even piggyback and do more um research on so sideways these are good comparables it'd be great mm -hmm. to have some appleton in there or right. something like that but you take a look these are profiles of communities that are fairly close in mm -hmm. um in breakdown with us but if it was simple yes and no answers you'd have asterisks all over the place because it's yes but and no but and so mm -hmm. you see a lot of those and yeah, this is this is very good reading and uh, you'll see that everybody has a different flavor. approach on these mm -hmm. things a different flavor mm -hmm. um, it, it, I wouldn't say anyone's bad or good because it meets their situation type of thing that's, Great. Yep, that's all I have thank you and then Oshkosh and history of TIFF in Oshkosh. I asked Darren to put that together since he has the greatest historical knowledge of the TIFF districts in the city of Oshkosh. And Who's going to be? Uh, That's it. Thank you. So we've um, got some handouts that Darren's prepared. Yep, we're doing a little handout. Uh, Kelly's handing out uh, kind of a tit snapshot that we prepared. Here's a map uh, of the uh, uh, TIDs in the city of Oshkosh. Up until today, uh, we've created 32 TIDs. Uh, I, just for historical reference, I, we, we're on TID number 32. TID 33 today was at a planning commission for Lemon. I started on TID 12. So all these TIDs from 12 to 32 have been involved with so yes, have a good historical background on them. Uh, what, colors, it, what are the colors referred to, Darren? The green, the pink is closed. The green are redevelopment or are redevelopment or blighted area tips, and the gray are industrial tips. So if you look at the tips that we've created of the 32, 17 are blighted or rehabilitation tips, 14 are, in, are, in, are um, industrial park tips, and one, we have one mixed use tip that was TID 22. <coughs> That didn't move forward because David was against it at the plan commission level. But it was. Jeez, I didn't know I had that kind of leverage. No, you do. It, it, it never, it never moved forward. It was, the, it was a shop. It was a shop code tiff. What happened? It was a victim of the recession. The recession hit just after it got passed, and so so it never proceeded. So the sheet that you're looking at is kind of a snapshot of, of where we are in the city with our with our TIF districts. And it kind of tells when it was created, when we we're projecting them to close, and th then some notes. I think that the important thing to look at on this particular sheet is if you look at the creation year. And you look at the creation years of the TIFs, and you can see that you know every once in a while you'll have a trend within a couple of years you'll you'll create a, you'll create a couple TIF districts and then for years you might get one or two or there'll be years in between TIF districts as of late what you can see is the market is turning somewhat uh, in, in the community and that you know we've had a succession of three or four tips coming through right now because things are changing in the community that doesn't mean that the market rates have changed so much in the community that everything if you look at where we're creating all of our tips uh, take a look at these maps you know th these are your industrial park tips but our redevelopment tips are all kind of concentrated in the downtown area uh, because what you have down there is you have environmental conditions you have old buildings you have you have a number of factors that that require that over the years have required the assistance of TIF. What you'll what you'll notice is a is you don't have any TIF districts here along the interstate along along our frontage roads. It's because the market. What we've said, with exception, what we've said is we want the market to dictate out here because it's mostly been greenfield sites. And we talk a little bit about the application history. We've actually turned down. TIF, TIF requests out in out in the 41 corridor. We've had those requests out there, but again, we've said that you know we we want we, we want the market out there uh, the to to dictate. Um, How many would you say, just roughly, since you've been here, Darren, mm -hmm. that have come to you but not made the pre-cut? That's a you know that's a question we, we were talking about before as part of this presentation. And it's routine. I, I can. We we don't write down 
we, we should probably be doing it, but we don't write down every time we say, because the standard operating procedure is you come in, you ask, are there any financial incentives? And we go, yes, no, yes, no, you know, depending, on, depending on what the situation is, we say yes or no. So we don't keep track of it. But we can tell you anecdotally, uh, you remember, does everybody remember Ramada Inn? When it was out nope. there on, on the west nope. side where Golden Corral is? When the dump kids were originally developing that, they came to us and said, can you assess this with TIF? And we said, no. Again, we think that the rates are, the, the market rates, the rental rates are, are substantially high enough out in the, out in the frontage road area that you should, and, and you're especially in that corridor, that it should support itself. We've had other requests. Um, there's some Mercy lands over here that are undeveloped, uh, just north of Mercy. Uh, we've talked to people, people have talked to us about CBRFs going, can we, can you assist us with putting some uh, TIF over here? And he said, well, it's a greenfield site. Unless this is some big super fun site that we need to put, you know, TIF monies in, why should we do that? So that's what you, you know, what you don't see is how many times that we actually, and we do say it, we said, no, it, it doesn't make sense to use TIF. You're seeing the product of us weeding out all those other, uh, other requests that come forward. So. And we, we need to be keeping better check. And I remember Mark, I, I emailed Mark like it was a month ago because we had heard you know about this whole, are, are we telling people no? I remember I had just told somebody nah, this is not eligible for TIP. It was somewhere out here on the west side. And I, and I emailed Mark right away on that. And he's rambling back and forth on it. But so would, you say, would you say it's fair to say then in the last uh, 10 years there have been approximately 10 no's? I mean, what kind of range can you give us? I'd say in the past two years, there have probably been 10 no's. I was going to say, every time we meet with a potential investor, developer, they always ask us a question about a TIF. It might just be uh, off the cuff, what, what's, your, what's your TIF policy? Or they might be very serious. Uh, we don't know how serious they are because they've never given us any, say, data to support a TIF application. Uh, but invariably, they ask about TIF because they know it's one of the few tools a community can offer uh, when it comes to economic development. That being said, though, do we have any other assistance sites, TIFs? I mean, from a local no, level? Yeah. No. We have no other economic. We can. We've been oh. very good at getting grants for developers and for development projects, so we can offer our grant writing abilities. Okay. Uh, but what's the revolving loan fund and, and the RLF, the Greater Oshkosh EDC administers right. so now for we the have city. That, and that, that's what I was yes. kind of getting at. The capital Catalyst Fund. I. The Capital Catalyst Fund, and maybe when Jason afterwards, yes, they created that fund earlier this year for uh, more startup and early stage developments. Right. Uh, but the typical developer who comes in who wants to do, say, a commercial building uh, isn't a startup. They're probably not going to qualify for the RLF. They invariably ask us about the TIF, and then we'll say no. It, usually, I think, you know, where we've been in situations, when people are coming up to us on the Highway 41 corridor, you know, and, and this is probably a very broad statement, but in general, uh, the Highway 41 corridor is not a good candidate because it's really not redevelopment. You know, the example Darren cited, that was before my time here, but I would have given a similar response. I can't imagine that. Uh, there are sites that the market will redevelop that site. I wasn't the old Walmart, though, didn't we include that as a as a redevelopment and aviation plaza because of the unique nature there and the, i always like to use this to explain to people there are so many restrictions on that because of its proximity to the airport right. that it creates unique uh challenges in terms of being able to let development occur there so that's one of those exception areas that is came that a redevelopment area? well it's not necessarily it hasn't not been designated se. one is at this point in time but would you call that blighted i think I'd probably yeah. venture a fairly good guess that a lot of folks would call it blighted, others don't. The real challenge there is that very few people can go there. You can't put a, you can't put a restaurant except at the very north end because that's considered a place of public assembly. So you've got all these restrictions there and that's tough. And the other one's Kmart. Now with that said, the development project that, that unfortunately fell through they did not ask for TIF assistance. We don't volunteer TIF assistance. Um, but would we ever look at, and maybe this is a discussion for later, just chew on this, designating, and, 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 and I think this is really where the city-led component comes, would we 
ever designate this is a TID. Come to us with your ideas. A TID candidate at this point? I think we have. Yeah. We certainly did a whole entire neighborhoods in 20 and 21, and maybe Darren can talk about those where we did the whole neighborhood and the city's experience has not been very good with that. Uh, so I think we've moved to a different model where it's more a, a project parcel by parcel almost rather than entire neighborhood. But uh, the city has done that in the past. There may be value in identifying target areas but not target, as, I'm but sorry. not, yes. yeah. but not Maybe formally, not formal, tip. not formal created. Because the once you create them, you've kind of handcuffed yourself on the value, and and you've started the clock. Probably the better like pre tid kind of yes designation. Yeah. I think one thing to keep in mind for those of us who have lived here a long time, we know what these areas were like before redevelopment. Almost every other one was a blighted area or about to become a blighted area. Had there not been the TIFFs and the TIDs, they would either be more blighted or they'd be just wasteland. So this is more, I think that this is more than just about dollars and cents. It's about the health of a community. I'm glad you brought that up, Mayor, because I think we use blight very much like we use the word clean up. And, you know, <clears throat> I guess I don't know if everybody has the same picture in their mind when we talk about blighted is blighted just vacant is blighted dangerous fire hazard is blighted you know what I mean so I guess maybe I'll be interested to see if we can whether or not we need to even explore having a, a clearer um, I guess explanation of blighted well, we do follow state statute when it comes to the blight, which I, would, I think I would direct Mr. Cameron. what the Supreme Court said about obscenity. I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> yes. What? I think the Park Staff Furniture Company was blighted. Absolutely. For a hundred years. Yes. yes. I will be getting into that portion yeah, when we get to the policy issues because I think that's a legitimate. You know, it's you just in the eye of the beholder. I prefer to say as opposed to. It, it, it all comes down to that. But Darren, because he has a history with, with a bulk of these TIFs. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've created a larger area of TIFs. For us, they failed. TID 20 was a horrendous failure for us. That was where Pioneer was supposed to redevelop. It never redeveloped, and we immediately lost $6 million worth of value. We've never been able to recover from that. Uh, TID 13 has been pretty good, but we've been able to rely on TID 7. Uh, to do that. Otherwise, you know, we've been very, we've been very sl or small with the, with the districts that we created. It's a good and bad thing. You don't, if you don't over tiff, you can't rely on another portion of that district to bail you out when things go bad. Appleton downtown, Richmond Terrace, same time as us with Hunter Block. Richmond Terrace was a failure at the time it was developed, but they were able to rely on other increment within that district to, to bail them out. We weren't, we weren't. Out, that didn't happen with us. For 100 block, but the nice thing about that is we we don't overcreate an area. So when the market changes around that area, everything goes to the overlying taxing jurisdictions. So it's kind of a different philosophy with with how we've done things. Um, over uh, to the tax incremental financing application, we created this a few years ago because what was happening was, and it's still to still today, every developer that comes in out through the door one of the first questions is financial incentives. They knew that TIF was out there and that we would create TIFs, TIFs, but you know, between the council plan commission development community, we had no standard, we had no criteria. So we felt that we had to create some type of policy and application. So when somebody comes in and says, is TIF available? We go, TIF, we, we, always, we, we consider TIF because we want to promote redevelopment, but we say, okay, look, at, look, in the, look in the TIF application. Do you meet the criteria? Do you meet the standards? And then, oh, by the way, we're also going to put a score to you. And then, so it, that is another thing that, that a developer, and we've seen a couple of developers look at them and go, no, we're not going to make it. So, so it's helped us. Uh, it's helped us be a little bit more efficient with our use. I think it's hamstrung us in some ways by having a policy. It, it, it's, it, it allows for less flexibility because if we if you don't meet the criterion, then we got to go and get a waiver. But you know, I, I still think it, I still think it's the, the best thing that that we've done. An example that may come into 
a lot of folks in the room's memory has to do with the hotel before Rich Batley and the, that group came forward. For at least two years, we were going back and forth with Mr. Gill in terms of this. And he did not, even though we didn't have the policy per se, we always had the application. And we welcomed him to submit because he indicated he wanted to take care of that blighted property. And the, the information we required <coughs> and essentially demanded from them, they couldn't or wouldn't produce for us. And it, I mean, we were, if, if they had produced the information that was there, we would have brought that forward. Um, the temptation would have been there to do it, but we didn't want to cut corners on that. And we said, we're, you know, we want to help you, but you must provide us this information because I have to look the seven of you in the eye and say, I recommend this. And so there's a lot of things that we shut out the door. That's probably near the top of the list because it came close. They, they, tr they attempted to fill it out. I think they attempted to see if we would check the homework. And we checked the homework every time and it was just not satisfactory. And we would turn it back they'd resubmit we were asking too much they were asking too much and and without documentation to to justify those types. thank you for that fond memory <laughs> <laughs> flashback sorry <laughs> um, to go back to uh, an observation that that uh, jason made uh, when it came when it come in talking about industrial uh, application or incentives uh, Historically, I think a lot of our um, gifts for, for industrial development have been uh, infrastructure, land and land and. Uh, so, if, if you are in a TIF district and somebody wants to go into vacant land, uh, can you lay over another TIF district for that for that development? No, we can also overlay TIF districts. I mean, that's we've we've overlaid several uh, over the years. Um, uh, you see three, seven. Um, there's a couple overlays down to where we created the granary. Granary TIF is an overlay of TIF 20. 20. Um, and then there's a couple There's a couple other ones out there, so it's possible. On the industrial side, we'd want to be careful because the whole TIF model out there was that the increment would pay for the infrastructure, and we're still paying, paying off the off. infrastructure. Yeah, no, I, I, to, I it would have to be a pretty unique... Um, industrial business that would uh, that we'd be willing to forego the infrastructure because of some other great benefit it would provide um, I haven't no, been I haven't been hit with that one yeah no but but I, I was trying to f figure out um, unless we had a an industrial uh, prospect that was going to a greenfield site that wasn't an industrial park we're we're, we're limited correct very limited and what kind of incentives that we can that we can give to uh, an industrial prospect? Well, for well, I mean, we have to be able to we have to either be able to create an, an industrial park tiff, a mixed use tiff, or we have to really be able to blight it. So if it's going on a greenfield site, it I mean, it, it's it's, it's, an industri it's an industrial. And you know, the, I was just thinking about it, the developer of the whole city city led tiff uh, kind of example you were alluding to a little bit before is. That's the kind of way we do the industrial parks. We get in, we get in, we, we do the land acquisition, we do all the infrastructure to offset the land acquisition, land acquisition costs on the other side. So we do it to some extent, because uh, we, we lower the costs of, of getting onto that property, but we don't provide any other incentives on the back side. How much, right. I guess, dovetailing does the RDA do with that in terms of land? Because they're, they're kind of acting like our little like land bank, right? Mm -hmm. Hanging on to stuff. So when acquisitions are done through the RDA, I mean, is there an overarching strategy within the RDA or is it just like whatever they get given or happens to come along? I mean. We do have two redevelopment areas that the RDA adopted and we continue to implement that. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about the Sawdust District, we do not have a redevelopment area for the Sawdust District. I expect when we adopt a central city investment strategy, <coughs> I expect the okay. redevelopment plan to be one of the outcomes of implementation. Well, the other thing the RDA does too is it, it does remove blight throughout the community. So it's, it'll get offered 
some really blighted areas in, in neighborhoods and we'll go ahead and, and buy that to remove that blight so that, that is a function that they but do. But there's not necessarily kind of a master plan predetermined, it's more of a opportunity driven uh, to some extent. I mean, we have redevelopment districts where we buy property in those districts, but I think lately it has been more opportunity based. I mean, yeah, there's been a lot more, say, blight outside our redevelopment areas than I think the city had planned on dealing with. We've been moving a little more towards residential blight, too. Correct. That's that neighborhood blight is one thing that the RDA has, has taken up the. I'll move it along. Banner for. If you could indulge me, the public comment, I, I need to go over to the county board meeting for the Buckstaff property. So the public comment period just ended. I'm getting I'm getting blow by blow detail. So uh, I, I don't have to leave yet, but if Darren could finish, then I could, because it kind of all folds into one. Q&A yeah, is yeah. great. I just, I was I thought it would go longer. So. Uh, well, we, we can always come back to it, but you know, we created, the, we, we created a scoring matrix uh, to try and get a, to try and rank some of the tips that are going through to, to a basic criteria. We do that internally. Um, we created a score sheet because we wanted to have something to go off of. So we created the score sheet. I, I, I guess we could, I, I could probably argue that we could get rid of a score and just say, are you meeting the standards um, as a criteria? So we get it because the score creates at least some subjectivity into the process and some will take issue with that. Um, TIF review process. Mark, do you got to go right now? Should I? Because no, no, no. I've got. I've got. I, when I get warning number two, okay. this was warning number one. Okay. So the TIF, for what? So the TIF review. The, the basic TIF review process. Every. The basic TIF review process is joint review board, plan commission, and common council. Now that sounds easy, that we're just running things through these through these uh, committees, but it's really not that. It, it doesn't really reflect the hours upon hours of staff time, Eller's time, developers time that go into getting us to the level of actually getting an application and project plan to you. So I'm just going to go over a quick, you know, just a little quick down what we do. Staff meets with the developer to discuss project. In, in, inevitably, we start to talk about the TIF need and, and applicability. Numerous projects in Laurier Lake, so we, don't, we haven't kept an official track. We weed out things from TIF consideration. You're getting the ones that we've been able to work through the process and we think are the strongest candidates. Example is the I-41 the, the corridor, the, you know, the Golden Corral out there, some senior living out there, uh, multiple family, industrial businesses, industrial parks. We've gotten that request. Some of our competitors actually do fun things in industrial parks. We've decided we're doing all the infrastructure providing the land. After consultation with staff, uh, if TIF money for the project can be justified, the application is, is discussed with the developer. So we need to get, we need to get some background from them. Uh, if they're still interested, we say, here, look at this application. Now really start to put pen to paper. Uh, preliminary uh, financial gap analysis is done. This is important consideration. I was trying to find all kinds of neat graphics for it, uh, for gap analysis. But we do gap analysis. We do gap financing. Others will just provide you, they'll create a district and provide you incentive to go in that district. We do gap analysis based on financial need for the project. So we're looking, how much does the project cost? How much is it kicking off? Uh, and how much is going back to the developer? We need to get you, the developer needs to make money in order to make the process, in order, in order to make the process go forward. They need a decent IRR, because if you're getting sub 5% on your return on investment, you have other vehicles to get a better return on investment. So the gap financing is what we, we spend a lot of time, we work with Ellers, the developer works with us, and so we're trying to identify that gap. That's what, we, that's what, that's what how our TIF policy is really set up. Do that before or after they pay the application fee? We do we do some rudimentary stuff before, so we'll we'll take a look at the numbers. We'll bounce some ideas. Uh, we'll we'll bounce some some basic performance before Ellers, and then we'll look at it because we know instinctively kind of what the process looks like. Then we'll go okay, the, there's something there. Submit the application and the fee, and then we, then then we engage. Then the we fully fee covers Ellers. Yes. Review right. Yes. Fee covers L, L, Ellers review. Uh, if we have to go to any outside consultant, it's meant to pick up that they sign, they sign their, they sign off, and if we have to go above what they're, what they're paying uh, in the fee, then they have to pay that as well. It's a development agreement that's done by an outside attorney, so we, we get we recover those but costs. But Ellers uses the developer's assumptions in their project. Yes, yeah. but but they they look at the they they analyze the developer's assumptions, so they're analyzing Frank. 
Well, you want to help me out here? I mean, they, you guys look at. Come on to the big table. <laughs> <laughs> Come on to the big kids' table, Frank. Oh gosh. I, Frank. We actually asked Frank Roman to attend because he's the guy who does the financial analysis for these projects. So Frank Why looks not? at the developer assumptions, and if he sees something, because he's got a, a lot of background experience with development, real estate development, if he sees something that looks odd in that, <laughs> Tim has his work with Frank. On some projects, if he th thinks something looks off on the assumptions, then we then we question it. Frank, uh, you, you want to go into a little bit more, and I mean, how you look at this? You look at their assumptions, and where do you go from their assumptions? Um, and I'm, I've got more to do in just oh, a bit here, but is he coming up? Yeah. yeah come oh, up. never mind. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, to your point, though, we review the developers' assumptions first of all, just to make sure everything ties out. I've seen a few times where we've gotten a uh, a project request and the numbers. Um, were so out of whack that once we informed the developer that he wasn't going to make those return, it was it was a lost project for him. His numbers looked like it was good. Once we walked through the numbers, showed him that it was a loss, he just rescinded his application. So we start with the developer's base level. Can we replicate what their returns are? We make sure all the, you know, the assumptions look appropriate. And then we'll do our stress testing from there. We'll talk about would this be better as a pay-go, as an upfront grant, as a combination of those. Um, we'll, we'll talk to lenders about, you know, kind of their lending, um, uh, you know, their thresholds. What are they doing in the market these days, cap rates, et cetera. So we'll go through a lot of that. Time. Now, in your strategy, if somebody rescinds this, there's no money recoup for the time that you've put into that so far, correct? Well, this, it was a first blush, kind of like Darren says, does this thing but even still, kind of I mean, sniff? You're, you're a paid employee. Correct? <laughs> we, we spec a little so time to, to take a look at something, first of all. But the application, is, uh, the application fee is already paying. This, this wouldn't even be an application right. fee. Right. Sometimes right. we'll, okay. we'll get us, hey, can you take a quick look? Does this make okay. sense? Back of the envelope. And we okay. may say, no way. Or, sure, it kind of makes sense. And then they'll start the clock and okay. get the fee in, et cetera. If they say, sure, it looks good, then we go, OK, maybe we can talk, talk about that application, submit the application and the fee, and we'll start to go further. So it's right. really, we're, trying to, we're, we're not trying to take money up front. We're trying, to, we're trying to talk with the developer a little bit, development community, see if it makes sense, either makes sense or it doesn't. If it looks like it makes sense, then we lead them down the path to the, you know, to the, the TIP application, all that. When you're looking at that then, when you see these really small IRRs, mm -hmm. do you not view that as riskier? Certainly. There's not as much cushion as a project that has a higher return. But looking strictly from the economic analysis of it, that's what I would come up with. But there's, you know, we've been talking about, there's the greater good. You have blighted projects. You have an area that you look, look to redevelopment. You have a housing need, you know, in any of those type of things. Mm -hmm. Then that becomes a, sure. a bigger discussion. But, you know, the, you know, we first opine on the, on the economics of the transaction. Then we can discuss, you know, does this make sense for what you want to do? So you are looking at that public benefit or? Yeah. And this is all part of that analysis process that leads up, and we can go through all that. Or you have the handout that leads up to us. You know, we get the TIF application in, we ship it. We, we'll look at it. We'll do some scoring on it ourselves. Uh, we'll ship it off to Ellers to do that more intense financial analysis. And then there's the time, the back and forth, the hours that we spent developing this project plan. We'll engage. We engage Ellers to write the project plans for us, and then it goes to Plan Commission, Council, Joint Review Board, things like that. Are you guys actually filling out the applications for the developer? No. Okay, there, there you go. Okay. Correct. Some we'll come in with handwriting that's illegible. <laughs> you have to uh, sometimes explain what parts they need to redo or fill in that they didn't the first time. Not every application is complete the first time in. Right. True. Yeah, it's, it'll, sometimes it'll take a few iterations back, a lot of iterations. We'll do some hand holding with, with new developers. Sure. If somebody's done this before, either here or elsewhere, you know, you have people that can do this. We you know don't the need drill. to be doing yeah. it. And then when Frank and uh, Ellers folks look at it, they they may be familiar with these people from another community as well. So they have familiarity with what they should be looking for with that with those respective developers. And Alan, can I just ask you a question on this next slide? Then um, see where where it's saying the policy changes. Are these true like formal policy changes, or are they? Practice changes, like changes in practice, de jure or de facto? Uh, 
that might be a mixture of them in here and there might be pieces of each in each of these items even the application uh, it was basically direction from council that we want a an application I think that's pretty close to policy but it really relates directly to procedure so I put that in in the past we never even uh, required an application now at least we get the same information from everybody yeah. and they do pay for the uh, application which in the past the city has been funding that uh, review and those those costs so it's basically there's a continual review and we implement best practices as needed Good way of putting yeah. it. Yes, and I will say, I mean, you can look at this chart of the communities that do not ask for applications, don't have a form formal policy. Yours is one that's more comprehensive than many that are out there. We regularly send our folks to training sessions, look for best practices. Um, I'm I'm very proud of the, the work we do. Is it perfect? Far from perfect, but I think we do a pretty effective job at vetting out. And when we see a new method of analysis we look at it and I think that's Alan here is uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the policy issues that can come before council I think Alan is really just trying to show over his tenure how things have evolved and tiffs of a few years ago are different and I think part of Darren's presentation I think was missed real quick was the last few years we've seen an increase part of it's the economy the, as the economy's turned around people are starting to move a little bit but the the nature of how TIFs are at least in Oshkosh done are a little different. We've gone away from the the big TIF areas and then and then do projects within that TIF area primarily because of what happened with Pioneer. Pioneer was a huge you know we we did it, it it's really mis, a misnomer. It's not Pioneer. It was the whole South Shore area, but Pioneer drags it down by six million dollars. That TIF is non-recoverable. Just absolutely non-recoverable. So that changed how we viewed things, and so I think that's what Alan wanted to kind of get through some of these things. And I'll highlight, no, give you a little context. One thing: when you, if you if you try and distill if you try and distill it down to a policy and codify everything into one policy, and I think Jason pointed it out earlier, you lose the flexibility you begin to lose flexibility of adapting to the projects as they come forward. So yes, there should be things that, you know, you may want to codify, but you also need to maintain that flexibility to address the issues because a project that comes forward today may be totally different than a project that comes forward six months from now because of the economic climate because of the different type of project that it could be what it is so we can't just simply say this is it and it's got to fit this or forget it because then well, you lose your flexibility it's all part of a bigger puzzle this with the grand right I read the Lamico you read it we had it on a plan commission I mean it's a very thorough research project and it but it is part of a much bigger picture than just whatever acreage acreage that the Lamico property was in. I mean, that's that's been a blight for what six, seven, eight. It was a blight when it's still in business. So it's been a blight forever. And again, I go back to my experience in real estate. You take people new to a community through a community, and they see thir certain things. They can't understand how a city can allow those things to happen, and they walk. They may be a home buyer. They may be a person looking to move a company they walk although we do have a finite amount to work with and I would argue that yes we need flexibility but we also can't let it be totally reactive that we have to be somewhat proactive so I don't think it's a black or white issue um, but I definitely agree with you guys that you know we, we do need to have the flexibility but we do also need to keep in mind, you know, there is a finite amount uh, to work with there. And aren't, aren't we at like half in the big picture? Uh, overall, we're close to half, but when we retire seven, we're gonna be in the low single digits again. Oh, that's right, seven's gonna come off. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that's gonna take almost 200 million off. Right. 
If we could get going, I'm oh, just sorry, afraid. I'm going, I still uh, haven't gotten my text number two. But, but some of the <laughs> some of the changes, the city used to have to do all the acquisition, demolition, remediation, and the public improvements. We've kind of turned the the coin on that. Uh, the scale we've talked about it used to be almost an entire neighborhood. Now it's almost a parcel based type of thing. Uh, the paygo versus upfront grants and borrowing. Uh, they almost universally were upfront grants or borrowing by the city in the past and now we've moved to the PAYGO model uh, and also the public improvements the source of funds since the city's conditions have changed over the years now the developer is actually uh, providing funding for uh, some or all the public improvements and we annually report uh, for each TIF district we incorporate that into the, the budget so we go over that every year which I don't think the council had ever done before until uh, that council said this was important to them so we we made that modification to the whole process so every year you'll see a TIF by each individual TIF district a budget update any questions on that section I will turn it over to Frank Roman do we have for each one of these lines, I know I've seen some reports, how many, obviously it doesn't always apply to the redevelopment, but it looks like in quantity we have more of the redevelopment, as he pointed out, Aaron pointed out, a lot of that relates to our central city. But do we have numbers, jobs either retained or created? Yeah, it's on the sheet. It's right here. Right here. Huh. Well, we yeah, a couple years ago, the council asked for that, okay. so we started. Yeah. But it, you've only seen it probably once a year. See, I looked yeah. at number of employees, and I just wasn't sure what that represented. If it was retained, created, what what does that represent? Well, that, you know, that's a tough figure for us to get on. Sure. To retain them. microphone. It goes with the economy. The, 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 yeah, the, the the retained ones are a tough one to get a handle on because we'll call and we'll do some inventories of what's going on in the industrial districts but we don't have an exact census of, of every job that's out there so it's a it's really a, that's a snapshot I can tell you probably the biggest one that we retained downtown would have been TID 15 and the four imprint TID that was so that saved several hundred jobs downtown I know that uh, because when we created that four imprint was on their way out of downtown or out of the community at the time That's part of the reason why we created TIF 15. So that's one I can point to that. We actually retain jobs. I think Bemis uh, was, was perfect seal on the north side uh, That was another one where we retained some jobs because they are looking at uh, those other plants uh, Mexico, so these numbers relate to number of created in general and would that be FTEs or it's again it, it's hard for us to get into each of the end I mean I uh, Kelly what, what's your comment on how we how, how I mean, they're not the easiest numbers to get I guess because you know mr. white mentioned this is you know in his view not necessarily an outcome but more of a process but I think outcomes as it relates to this is pretty critical it also could mean jobs saved or retained right, absolutely I yeah. think if you look at the numbers, most of those numbers, there's a lot of N slash A not applicable. Mm -hmm. And those are areas where it was more of a retention thing. So we haven't tried to take credit too much for retained jobs because that's a, a mushy, yeah. mushy number. Fuzzy math. But, you know, we're relying on uh, reporting uh, yeah. that, that we get Census, from the state. state. You know, and sometimes they give you a range. Sometimes they'll give you a number. It might be outdated. So... We use Greater Oshkosh Economic Development Corporation, some other tools out there to kind of give you an average, you know, the best shot that we can. The Bemis, and the Bemis TIF did basically what that was. That was also a relocation of manufacturing from a plant that was being closed in Philadelphia, bringing that manufacturing <coughs> to Oshkosh. What about the E-Code facility for Oshkosh Corp? That was... So it's 54. There's about 250 people working in that building right now. So how often are these numbers updated? Or are they it's, fact checked? We, we, we update these every year. And the problem is it's, it's difficult to get the numbers from the businesses if they have multiple locations. And Bemis and Oshkosh Corp are good examples because they have different sets of employees in different TIF districts, actually, in the city. And, and you re it's really hard to get that information from the, the from the corporation as well as, that, as well as that can also that a lot of businesses deem that as confidential information yes so that they don't want their competition to know and it changes by the month right at these but you know that being said I, I know the one I highlight is what you had mentioned and that was uh, uh, for imprint um, the, imp the I think the impact is much greater than the 200 jobs saved 
and notwithstanding what they did at the distribution center, uh, you know, and that number uh, was credited to the other TIF, but it, you could argue it was, it could have been. But, but I mean, down. I mean, you're looking at hundreds of jobs. Uh, that and, and uh, yeah. also supply yeah. chain too. Well, yeah, and it's yeah, but I mean, no, no, but direct. I mean, that that are that are housed there. I would think that. Would you like us to keep? Some, moving? Yeah, I don't know. If that's well, if we, we do. Can, these questions are great. I just yes. I'm torn, but yeah. I, do you, can, if you need to go, do you want to? No, nah, because you know I got to be. I got. I'm the closer, so you know, bring in the right hander. So I got to do it. So I'll be the setup guy. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Roman, uh, who will talk briefly, I guess, about the. I will try to uh, talk in, briefly in, here, during the time we have. Um, so we've already kind of discussed a, a little bit of what we look to do. Um, so first of all, and we've, we've touched on some of this, what do you want to offer incentives? Economic development, remove blight, et cetera. Um, Darren touched on uh, the, the developers and investors need to have a certain return, especially for the level of risk they're taking on. You can buy treasuries for 2.25% you know, right now and, and make a marginal return on a very safe investment. But if you're building a project, there's all these different forces that come in, so you need to be compensated adequately for it. So that's part of what we look at um, in this process. Not an excessive return, because this is taxpayer money, but a reasonable return. Um, and that's where the but for clause comes in as well. You know, does this project need a level of gap financing that would make this a reasonable return? Um, the due diligence, we, we talked about a little bit of what we go through. Um, I won't dwell on that really too much. Um, this, right? oh, here we go. Okay. Anyway, um, a couple of the, the measures um, that we look at on a, on a project, most of the projects are a, we call a rent or a hold situation. <coughs> Commercially, you look at about a 10 year investment period. Um, you can either look at cash on cash returns, which is the annual payment that an investor or developer would get on his money that he's invested. Um, a lot of what we look at is an internal rate of return. So it's that cash on cash plus the uh, sales proceeds or a, you know, if it doesn't sell by year 10, we do a deemed sale uh, at market conditions at that time. Um, and, then we, and then we discount those proceeds back. And so we have typical ranges that we look at. Again, these are, um, ranges for different type of projects. A, a more stable project would might get a, or a more um, uh, secure project, I suppose, might might get a 12 to 13% return, but something that has a little bit more hair to it might need an 18% return or some, something of those ranges. So um, some of the factors that go into this are construction costs. Um, you know, Land costs are going up a bit. Some of the construction costs, concrete, steel, some of that's going up. Um, so we look at that. We look at the funding sources. You know, the what's the loan that the developer has that they're going to utilize? Um, what type of equity are they putting in? Are there other sources such as tax credits, brownfield grants, any of that that's available? And then is there a gap? Is there something that you know a, a hole that they need to fill? And and we we go through all that um, as part of our but for test. So um, with, I mentioned some of the other ones, there's low income housing tax credits and, and, and those that are beyond us right now. Uh, but with tax increment financing, again, we talked about upfront grants, uh, PAYGO, and then other, another item that is, uh, I want you to consider is called a developer monetized PAYGO. So instead of the developer receiving part of that tax increment every year, um, which is based on a, a, a note that the city would give to the developer that we will pay you X percent of the increment generated. Uh, they can take that note and go to a lender and say, hey, I'm going to get $3 million over the course of this development, and the lender may give them $2.4 million up front. So that's the way the developer can monetize that stream of payments, and instead of having to put in an additional equity up front, they can monetize that and have that lower their equity requirement. That may lower their gap, too. So all these factors come into play on the financing side. Do, our, <clears throat> do we see that happening with any of ours that, that you've been reviewing, this developer monetized PAYGO? Um, looking at one right now. Yeah, and a, a, number, a number of other communities have done that too. 
It's not always um, a done deal, but it's a concept to consider, and, and we do look at that and, and ask those questions. And what about bankruptcy? On behalf of, on behalf of the developer? Yeah, if they're, if they're with the bank. If it's a um, pay-go note that they are monetized, it's the developer's risk. And I'll, I'll look at that in a minute here, too. I'll get to a, a slide on that. So I'm, I'm trying to go through this at Mark's uh, mm -hmm. Keep going. time here. So um, basically, this would be a, a theoretical project budget on the top. You have the sources of funds. On the bottom, you have the uses, construction costs, land, you know, financing, et cetera. And you can see on the right, um, if project costs change by, you know, 5% up or down, you can have some cost savings or you can have some, you know, additional uh, a, a gap that needs to be identified and, and, and addressed. Um, obviously, sources have to use have to equal um, uses. We've seen applications don't don't always do that the first time around. A little detail. Um, so again, we're looking at the developers. Uh, you know, their bank their bank financing, how that works, uh, that structure, their equity. You know, is it all cash equity? Are they deferring some fees? You know, how much is in there? Um, you know, the financing uh, lenders are pulling back a little bit in some areas on their loan to cost or the loan to value. So we want to make sure we kind of keep, you know, our, our um, attuned to the market on what's going on in the lending market as well. Um, and then just uh, very briefly, uh, capitalization rates is a, is, a, is a way to assess the value of a property. Um, uh, you basically divide the net operating income provided by the property by a cap rate to determine a value. So a lower cap rate is a more um, uh, secure project, a higher cap rate evidences more risk in general. So in our world, when we go through a project pro forma, we're looking at the operating expenses of the project in addition to the cost. Operating expenses, what are the utilities, insurance, are they uh, setting aside money for capital um, improvements or, or repair, replacement? Um, property taxes is a big one where um, we work with the assessor to make sure that we're both on target as far as what's going to be actually assessed on the project, make sure there's no surprises to the developer or to, to ourselves. And, and we've seen some issues where sometimes the number's been higher, sometimes lower, uh, but that goes into our report to the city to say this is what you should be able to expect um, on the returns on the project as far as the taxable uh, revenues. Um, you know, I touched on replacement reserves. Um, you know, you can't have a rooftop HVAC unit go out and expect to just ask the tenants for more money. The developer's got to put some money aside for that into a sinking fund, if you would, to provide for those type of repairs. So we talked about NOI, net operating income. It's basically the, oh, sorry. Sorry. It's basically the, uh, like the building says, uh, revenues in and spending expenses out. Um, NOI is what lenders will look at to determine how much debt a property can support. So that goes into the lender's underwriting. And again, as I mentioned, uh, you divide the NOI by the cap rate to determine a project value. Um, so the NOI, not to bore you, but it's operating expenses, taxes, reserves, but does not include their debt payments. And otherwise, you take the de developer's financing out of it. What is the property generating on its own uh, to support itself. Um, some developers um, in a PAGO situation put their TIF receipts above the line of NOI. We feel that it artificially inflates not only the value but the project's performance. Uh, so we approach it on a conservative basis, <coughs> very conservative basis. Uh, and we think that that really represents the true operating capacity of the project. Below NOI? Yes. Um, so after we look at the project cost, we look at um, a mythical stellar project in stellar Wisconsin. Uh, and this, I'm not going to get in the weeds on this, but just kind of here's the revenues up on top, the residential rent for an apartment project. Uh, there's other residential income, could be garage fees, could be storage, miscellaneous pet fees, what, ha what have you. Um, from that total gross revenue, there's uh, always a vacancy factor. You never underwrite to a full 100% occupied, because they generally are not. Um, and that's, again, we're in touch with the market on what those vacancy factors should be for these projects. 
Uh, and then you go down and analyze the expenses. You know, we've talked about the utilities, the property taxes, you know, our management fees and other things like that in line with market convention. And at the bottom of the, the chart, uh, the net operating income number, you know, produced in this example, $1.64 million. Um, if you flip to the next page, um, this takes that, those figures and brings it forward into a 10-year cash flow. So we can see how the project's gonna operate over time. We'll use this then to help project the taxable increment that should be received during that period. Um, it's a lot to run through, I won't, I won't delve into it, but um, if you go about two thirds of the way down, there's an orange line that says net operating income. That's what we just kind of went through the last slide. Um, in the green and then blue uh, line right below that, um, so we're talking about the, the uh, PAYGO payments that the developer receives throughout that period. Um, that adds to his total cash flow, uh, which helps him pay some debt service. Uh, I mentioned the monetized TIF loan, which is below, so that PAYGO payments should pretty much offset his cost of borrowing that money on the, uh, on the note that the city gives them for the tax increment. Uh, uh, towards the bottom in the blue, annual debt coverage. Again, um, you want to obviously at least cover your debt service. Generally, banks will look to a 1.25, 1.3 times coverage to make sure that they have enough uh, coverage in case a, a tenant slips out or something like that. Um, and then we get an internal rate of return. Um, and we talked about that as one of the more common means that we use to evaluate a project. And it's the discount rate of which the project cost, your equity and, and, and whatever that goes in, uh, is offset by the net present value of the cash flows coming out of the project, the annual revenues that go to the developer plus the sales proceeds. Those are discounted back and provides a certain rate of return. Um, again, all things equal, a project with a higher IRR would be the first project chosen. But as I mentioned, you could have a project that, uh, you know, IRRs can also reflect risk. So if you have a, a project that has some environmental <coughs> contamination, you know, there's, there's some unknown potential there where the owner or the developer uh, might expect to be compensated a little bit higher because of that environmental risk. As you all know, environmental risk can get very deep, very costly. Mr. Mayor, I got my warning that I need to go over there. So Frank, you're good. Alan will do my wrap up. I should be back, but sorry about that. I'll let you know how it goes. Slow down now. Maybe slow down. Ah. Okay. Good luck. Don't slow down. Too have fun. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so um, carrying that, um, you know, the cash flows that we did before, carrying that forward in, in, into an IRR calculation, um, again, on the top part of this chart, we've, we've simplified the NOI. Uh, for example, in the year 2027, year 10, we're showing an NOI of 1.863 million. Divide that by the capitalization rate and we get a project value of, a gross project value of 27.6 million. At that time, you know, assume the developer sells the project, he repays his debt, he has uh, a million seven at the end of the day after sales commissions, et cetera. Um, you bring that million, 11 million seven down, add that to the annual cash flows in the green column, and at the bottom of the page, through the magic of Excel, um, we get an internal rate of return, in this case, of 12.23%. So again, without belaboring all the numbers, that's basically how our process works. Uh, I know I, I skimmed through this very quickly, but I just want to kind of show you the level of detail that we go into to help the city vet these projects and determine if there's a, uh, you know, it should have a reasonable chance of support uh, for financing. This is one I really want you to look at, though, is when is the incentive provided and the level of risk? And this is what you um, mentioned, uh, Asby? Asby. 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 Sorry. Um, so who takes on the risk, when, and how is it shared? And at the beginning of the project, if the city would issue a grant or maybe a loan, um, the city's kind of almost an equity partner in the deal. Their money's in up front as well. Um, there are some development agreements where uh, there are certain milestones where you may offer some funds if they hit, um, you know, completion of the core and shell, if they hit a, uh, the occupancy permits, 
if they get up to a certain percent leased, whatever, you can dole out some money here and there. That's kind of the medium part of the risk. You're still providing that, um, uh, you know, that cash. Um, but then at the bottom, you see the, the risk, the arrow gets darker, the level of risks uh, reduces uh, to the city, at least, and, and obviously turns over more uh, risk to the developer, where the um, developer's receiving his money through the tax increment that he produces by building this building and creating value. If he doesn't create the value, he doesn't get the funds because it's only shared by how much value he creates in that tax increment. So I, I hope that addressed your question from a little bit earlier. Um, briefly, you know, we talked about um, once we uh, verify the developer's numbers and we're on the same page, we'll stress test them. Again, we, we talked about can this be a grant, does the, uh, should it be a pay-go or combination? You know, does the city have a policy and does the city have the capacity to fund a grant or do they have a policy that they traditionally do pay-go or, you know, uh, and again, some of the communities you saw don't have this policy. So we work with the, with the municipality in that respect as well. And then, um, you know, in, in the project level world, we also then say, how does this work within the overall TID? Are there other considerations of how much this project contributes to the TID? A lot of what um, Oshkosh has been doing has been single project TIDs. Um, you know, Mark mentioned the Pioneer Project that sucked down a lot of, a lot of money in that. The single purpose TIDs or single project TIDs limit that risk to that project. So you don't have a, a good project that's doing well in a larger TID and then other project goes south and it deter detracts from that project. So we're trying to, like setting up an LLC for a business, you're limiting your risk to that particular entity or that project. So that's um, the crux of most of this, and I don't want to step on Alan's toes on this, but it, the, the pro forma review and the financial review and all that leads into a concept called the look back or a clawback provision. Um, so the pro forma review demonstrates how does the project perform, you know, how successful is it um, in its uh, projections. And then um, we talked about how do you measure by cash on cash or IRR. Um, but then when you have a look back provision, you can go back at the end of the day, at the, after the end of the 10 year period or a, a project sale or whatever it is, and you can go back and use the actual numbers throughout that investment period and say, okay, we projected it to have a 12.23% return. Wow, rents really went up. They didn't spend as much as they thought they were going to on the project and they got a 19% return. Well, the look back provision allows for, and you'll delve into this a little further, allows for the community to um, participate in some of the upside of that. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's taxpayers' money. So if the, the community is going to invest some money in a pay-go or in a grant to allow the developer to make a reasonable return, if they make an excessive return, the look back provision provides for some cost sharing or some savings in that respect. Or early elimination of the subsidy. Yes, yes. So again, I didn't want to jump on your yep. horn. So um, is there anything I can answer quickly? Just one question, Frank. How do you evaluate the track record of the applicants? In this whole process? Um, if we know them, we can look at other projects that they've done. Um, you know, so we work in a number of you know, smaller communities as well where there's um, uh, a local gentleman who's got a piece of land who wants to develop it. So it, it all depends, you know, case by case basis. Um, we do try to vet, you know, the developer and what we know of them um, through uh, other communities that have worked with them. If they work in a neighboring community, how'd that project go? And we'll work with them that way too. Anybody? All right, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thanks for having me at the table. Thank you. Don't go too far away since we might want to talk about more IRR issues. All right. Uh, I got two sections to cover. One is the follow up to the development agreements, and I think there's a slide for that. Yeah. Uh, development agreements, uh, that's the requirement for an agreement between the city and the developer that boils down the TIF plan and the TIF projects into a legal agreement that we work with sometimes out, outside council and always with the city attorney's office. Uh, to boil that down uh, so that we have the project scope and contributions, who's paying for what, 
We've identified the financial gap and the percentage of the tax increment used for the PAYGO or the gap. Uh, the look back provision, which Frank touched on, we've started including those on the, the last few years worth of TIFs because uh, we don't want to, say, uh, enrich the developer more so than, uh, than filling just the minimum gap. Uh, so we have started including those elements uh, in all our development agreements. Uh, we are looking at time limits or dollar limits that come out of the agreements that we have for our tax, tax increment finance districts. Again, that's related to the gap or the IRR that we've identified. And unfortunately, a lot of the TIFs have environmental liabilities that we also have to <coughs> delineate between what the city's responsible for and what the developer's responsible for. So those will oftentimes end up in the development agreement. But everything we've talked about regarding TIF policy or the application, the analysis, and the IRR does, does eventually get uh, boiled down to the development agreement. And uh, while the TIF plan goes through the Joint Review Board and the Plan Commission and the City Council and back to the Joint Review Board, the development agreement just goes to the City Council. So that's kind of the, the implementation of everything that went into the TIF plan and the application and the, the stress test and the, and the review. Uh, that's oftentimes figured out during the program, uh, but oftentimes uh, it doesn't uh, occur until you actually have a TIF plan adopted and then the development agreement uh, starts. If in, a, in a perfect world, I'd love to see the development agreement and the TIF plan come before the council simultaneously, uh, but the development agreements take quite a bit of time to figure out all the moving parts until we have all those pieces settled down with the TIF and the developer and the city, then we can bring the development agreement forward. But just as a general timing thing, you'll have the TIF plan first and then the development agreement. On the developer agreement, do we kind of take the lead on that then? Yes, uh, and we, we typically kind of tell the developer we draft what we'll provide and then we open. draft the first version of the development agreement that matches our understanding of the TIF plan and their application. Uh, and oftentimes that we come up with different scenarios regarding well, what if this happens or what if that happens, and then we have to start thinking about other things because every developer is a little different and every site's a little different but yes the city does start that and that be, meaning the city that's you darren kelly yep and the city attorney's office or, a, or an outside council and and ellers right i have a question um that kind of goes to i guess some of the assumptions before we got to this point and that's some cities have um taken the approach of taxing vacant or blighted parcels and they make the distinction between the two at higher rates because of the blight and the eventual cost to the taxpayer um, so with the land and the improvements we already have that two-tiered approach in our assessed values mm -hmm. but my question is um, I did ask Luke from the assessor's office to give me some history on some of our more recent properties and some that look like they may be coming our direction with some TIF applications in any event. It looks like we have in the past actually assessed lower those land values um, leading up to the eventual, I guess, designation of blight. And I guess my question is, you know, is that something that we have looked at in the past as a, as a city actually adding either a special assessment or uh, a different rate of taxation on those? I don't even know if we're able to do that. I'm not sure we can actually do a separate assessment and the city attorney is coming out of the crowd <laughs> to Hi. help answer that question because I think there's constitutional issues when it comes to something right. like that. <laughs> because there's some state law problems with with the um, assessing different properties at different rates and they there's the uniformity clause and so I'm not sure that's well, this is not something I've heard from other municipalities that, in that Wisconsin. That, yeah that was my question I was looking at like Hartford Pennsylvania Washington they have yeah under Wisconsin law I don't believe we would be allowed to do that um, 
the and, and as far as the special assessments we would you know we can do special assessments for things that we do to benefit the property if we cut lawn right. grass exactly. or do those kind of things sure. so that we do if right. if we provide services to those properties but okay well my okay. assumption is that those people are not paying taxes anyway so we can tax the hell out of them and we still aren't going to get paid so it's just a, it's a waste of I think staff time but I think to Lori's point, what she's saying is that they're in other states. They look at the ability to do that because at some point, if somebody purchases the property, they pay the back or they have to pay the back taxes as well. You know, and it's a way to <clears throat> possibly fund some of the blight through the municipality. What Lynn is saying is that in Wisconsin, that's not an option. As it is right. now, you know, our, our our school, our county, we we end up subsidizing blight and rewarding blight and and I guess I'm just looking at what you know what are some of our other approaches there or what have some of the other discussions been about the approaches besides um, the de delayed benefit of the increment to those entities thank you take that up with the people yeah I guess we have to work within the laws we are given so mm -hmm. But I, I am very impressed, um, and I know you're going to do a wrap, but uh, to look back at the stuff that Ellers does on our behalf on, on uh, really going through the financial sides of those types of things when it gets all put together. Uh, because I think that's the biggest concern I have, approving TIFs, is, is that financial side of the concerns that the citizens have of the city getting involved with all these different TIFs. And, you know, you start talking about donor tips and you start talking about all the other things. And as Mark talked about the tip for the Pioneer South Shore redevelopment uh, being so underwater, they'll never come back. Right. Um, that's a concern. You know, that being said, I think we've done a much better job of, of looking at these smaller tips, if you want to call them that, because that's what they are at this point, um, so that we are protecting the city and our citizens. And I guess I kind of like to hear from the school board you know how they viewed when you're sitting on the joint review board at these and looking at the butt for I mean do you have concerns well this is my first time sitting in on one of these meetings I'm actually pinch hitting for Allison Garner our board president um, I don't know my first impression when I look at this data is um, with the exception of last year um, and since 2001, there has not been more than one TIF approved by the city. And if you look over the last 14 year period, um, you can see that there were only nine TIFs and four years where there were zero TIFs. So I would be curious to know if that's a lot compared to other cities. Or I'm sorry, did, did you say there had not, there had only been one? Oh, I'm just looking at the data from 2002 to 2014. There were only nine TIFs here that are listed. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the um, going down the years, there weren't any TIFs in 2004, 2007, or 2008, or 2011. So I guess my question is, is that what you would normally see? Is that a lot compared to what other towns have done? Or well, yeah, I guess um, from what I read, you know, some utilization rates, um, we're kind of ranked like the third highest amongst about a dozen municipalities in terms of our utilization percentage. We've created, uh, especially in the last few years, we've created a lot of one parcel or small area TIFs. And as an example, uh, the granary, that was in the South Shore, so that would have been kind of hidden by a big neighborhood TIF. Uh, but now we call those out individually, so we'll get more TIFs. But the utilization, when it comes to the total value, we're still way sh we're at fifty percent approximately out of the uh, max. our maximum. We have a, a hundred, almost a couple hundred million room cap room, I think, right now. Right. Okay. Wasn't well, there? Well, didn't, you, didn't you also include though that that it, in the near future we're going to be paying one off, which is yes. going to take the utilization rate down to like we're two at or three percent now, and Nina's at nine point one. Wausau's at 8.51, we're seven, and then the rest of the ranked ones out of about a dozen are all, um, oh, I'm sorry, De Pere is right on par with us. 
the rest of them are all like three, four. So by statute, we can only create so much. Right. Only yes. so much of our value, value can go into a TIF. Test value. Yes. Equalized value. Equalized value. I think there was a period when TIF was a dirty word too to the council, and they they didn't want to do anything. I think we're paying for a lot of things that weren't done for a lot of years in the city. We're probably a victim of our success as well because TIF seven was so successful that I think everybody expected the performance of TIF seven with every subsequent TIF, and that was it was a risky TIF that had high risk, but it had super high rewards and with all the donor uh, donor contributions we made from TIF 7 demonstrate just how successful that was it paid off uh, it's able to pay off all its debt and help out a few more struggling TIFs. so I think we were, that was part of it and I think the expectation was why isn't it more successful you can take a look at some of the examples that Kelly pointed out that uh, we do things very similar to other communities in terms of uh, taking risks and, and reaping the rewards. We're doing TIFs now that have fewer rewards, mm -hmm. but they have much less risk. TIF uh, 7, nowadays, I don't think we could do it. I, I just don't think we could. So Lori, I don't think I answered your question, but I can't speak for the school board. Up, but um, <clears throat> as a community member, I. I support the last tips that you guys have approved. I think yeah. everyone has said it. It is an accepted way. Forty-five states are doing it. The reason why forty-five states are doing it. But I don't think we're talking about whether to do it or whether not or not to do it. I don't think it's a black and white either or. It's more about when and how and how long. I, I, that's, that's what I a nice segue we to the policy section that yeah. Mr. Roloff arrived. And I just caught my breath just in time, a little yes. sweaty, <laughs> going up and down the stairs. But uh, just so everybody knows, it passed the county board 30 to 1. So very excited the county uh, went along with that. And I showed up just enough time for the county treasurer to say everything I was going to say anyway. So worked out great for me as well. So um, happy to be back. Um, in looking at policy options for council some of it really comes down to how much flexibility you want to give yourselves how much discretion you want to give yourselves it's kind of a, a balancing act there there needs to be standards and that's the reason we have a tip policy the council's already determined that they want some standards set the question is is how rigid do you want those standards and how flexible do you want to be um, you know, I, through this analysis, and I had an opportunity, and I don't want to speak for Council Member uh, Pansky, but on the way over, I was paraphrasing my presentation, and, and she said something effective. We, we are farther ahead than most communities ba based on what she saw in the presentation, and I believe we are, but that doesn't mean we should rest on our laurels. We should continually look for ways to make our uh, standards better. Now, with that said, some of my colleagues is, uh, uh, I've been talking to them we talk about these things and it's like you don't want to go too far you get too rigid because then you don't give your council flexibility and and so I'm just telling you from other colleagues flexibility is a value that they have as well because you're gonna ask yourself one day if you went too far to one side you'd say well why why couldn't we approve this well it didn't meet the standards you set well how do we change it well y you got to give yourself flexibility with that um, but above all, our TIF policies should be designed to meet certain strategic goals, whether that is within our strategic plan or within our redevelopment plans. And I think part of the statistics to show most of the redevelopment TIFs have been in the downtown area. We, have, we, had, a, we had a downtown action plan back in 2001. We're developing a central city investment strategy. And with the possible exception of maybe the Mercy TIF, mm -hmm. all of these other TIFs are in our <coughs> central city. So in that regard, they're in keeping with a plan. Um, when you start getting out of the area, you have to really evaluate that. Uh, was Mercy blighted? Well, given the fact that you had a 100-year-old hospital leave, that it was going to get more blighted. question is, is when do you step in? When do you let the private market? 
I wish I had the magic answer for you because there is no magic answer, but you feel it, you know it, you know it when you see it type of thing. Um, I think we're at least comparable to in our approach, but if there are improvements you want, we can certainly do those things. Um, we have significant redevelopment needs, and that is probably the result of us being an old industrial town. I would argue that our industrial needs are greater than some other communities. That's not necessarily a positive thing, but it's also it does present a lot of opportunity. Um, the the TIFs that we've done, particularly the larger TIFs that we did, the Marion Road one, from a financial performance standpoint, I can accept the criticism that it hasn't performed as well financially, but it has achieved the redevelopment goals because those of you who have been here for a number of years, and I don't want to insult anybody by, by giving eye contact to too many of you, but for those of you who have been around, you know what we had in Marion Road and what we have now. Lamico, as somebody said, is the last vestiges of that. Um, Morgan District's another example. Uh, and the Pioneer is different because Pioneer is only a 50 year old. You know, it got created 50 years ago and now it's getting uh, redeveloped. But those, we have significant needs and TIF is our strongest tool. So do we want to be selective? Yes, but we have a lot of needs. Now, does that mean we're less selective? That's where the whole discretion thing comes in. How much do you want to, how do you, do, how much do you want to hamstring yourself? Or how much do you want to say, look, we need to use this for the, the best of the best, or in some cases, the worst of the worst. But you know, I think you understand what I'm saying. Um, like I said, my recommendation is really, I, I want to give you maximum flexibility to make decisions based on the value of the project to the community and in meet, meeting your goals. Now, that's a very general recommendation, but I think you need to keep that, that in mind. In terms of the policy choices, <coughs> The TIF scoring criteria, uh, the council asked us to take a look at two. We believe that you may even want to set a cr uh, criteria for a mixed use because while the only one we have on the books never really got off the ground, the, the, the Shopco TIF, that was my first TIF. It had failed. Not exactly something I'm proud of, but it was intended to do the right thing. I think we need to keep that open as an option and that you know, a lot of people don't want to do a mixed use TIF. Why? Because it's only 20 years. But the reality is, is I don't think you should force it into calling it a blighted <coughs> TIF to get seven <coughs> extra years out of it. If it meets the criteria, I think we need to stick to our criteria. So I think we should develop three. And what I've asked Mr. Davis and his staff to do is kind of tear a page out of the book from the uh, uh, Long Range Finance Committee when they developed the criteria for uh, uh, for CIPs. Thank you. I was tongue tied there. Um, for CIPs, staff filled in the the blanks in terms of how you get the maximum points and minimum points, but it was out there for everybody to see. And I think council had an opportunity to make tweaks to that, but ultimately said this seems good. And quite honestly, I think it works well. It also works well because we don't necessarily say a pass-fail grade. Um, going the extra mile to develop criteria, I think there's value to that. We didn't do it for CIPs, and even though there are, there are utility TIFs and there are building improvement TIFs, to totally different worlds, but I think there's value to what the council has suggested, and, and I've asked staff to create criteria for all three. You've seen the two, even though we haven't had council formally adopt them. When we knew this workshop was forthcoming, they had our, the staff and community development had already direct, uh, developed some draft criteria. So I think we're ready to bring you the two. You can adopt the two and then work on the mixed use. It's not like we got a mixed use one coming you know, around the corner or anything. We, I think we just need but to do that. But that could happen with the downtown uh, or the central city investment strategy if that most of those would probably be redevelopment, redevelopment but, but there's a possibility you could get into that area, especially if if we were ever to do something that was a little more on the residential side, there's a little more flexibility, isn't that correct, Alan, with, with the mixed use in terms of yes. residential? Yes. I mean, ultimately, isn't that 
really what the Morgan should or could have been was a mixed use because you had retail, you had office, you had residential. Mm -hmm. But it was also blight. Well, I mean, yeah, obviously, from the standpoint of if you want to max out and use the longest possible. Right, and, and I guess that's, and, and that's to, where we... And I'll get to that point, because yeah. that's one of the... As you see, I've, I've got that uh, down my list as well. So TIF scoring criteria, I think we should go to three, and we're ready to, to give you two, but I think you... From what I've heard from council, I think you want us to fill in the blanks a little more, so it's like it's five points if you meet this general criteria, because I think there's some questions about, well, why'd you give three versus five versus one? And I think we can do that. Um, again, we want to give council flexibility, but part of the flexibility lies in you don't necessarily, I think our policy says 50, you got to have 50 points. Or get a waiver from the council. Or get a waiver. So the, again, the whole idea is flexibility. Um, it's not that, doesn't mean that 100 means you, it's an automatic given. It doesn't mean that 49 is an automatic failure. You want that flexibility. The types or size of the district, I think the history has, has started to show that what used to be a TIF and what is now a TIF has really evolved. We're doing more smaller ones. Um, I can tell you that when I was in Berlin 20 plus years ago, this is what Berlin did because otherwise a small community, the entire downtown would be, would be TIFed and then you're killing time, as, as somebody said, and the Morgan District's a good example. The fact that they've delayed is really hurting them. Because, and if we, and TIF 20, did I get the number right? Yeah. South Shore? South Shore. I mean, we over TIFed. Why? At the time, the Pioneer was going to happen any, any day now. Um, I'm still spewing that optimism, but until they submit a TIF application, I don't want to move on it because I'd hate to have a TIF created and then we sit and wait. And that's, to me, that just, that's not a good recipe. Um, so the size, I think, has evolved. Uh, does, wo does one building limit our risk? I think it does. Um, is one building too small? I don't think so. So, but that's for the council to decide. Maybe the flip side of it is, is what's too big? Because the bigger it is, the riskier it is. The smaller it is, the less riskier it is. That's just the nature of the beast. Frank can give you a better analysis on a single building than he can for a whole area. Because there's so many variables with a larger, uh, larger area. And you, you, got your, you can get your hands around a single building. Um, but they're all but, different sized buildings, too. And they're all different sized buildings. And, 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 and different buildings are different things. Without the historic tax credits, Beach and Washington wouldn't have even happened. TIF, as great as it is, wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And those, those are other things. So the types or sizes are something uh, you want to consider, but do you necessarily want to set a standard? There may be a little bit more of know it when you see it. The number of TIF projects, I think I'm kind of repetitive with this one. The trend in Oshkosh is smaller project in designated areas. Um, some of the TIF policies that we've read from other communities have said it's got to meet a, deter, a, a designated economic development goal. So to go to Council Member Palmieri's point, do we, do you don't f necessarily form a TIF, but do you go out and identify areas so people know, look, you know, along 41, there are certain areas, maybe Kmart, maybe aviation. <clears throat> but even Kmart, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to just say, yeah, we'll TIF it because then it's almost like TIF for sale. And I, th that group didn't come to us and ask for a TIF. Now, they didn't happen, but it wasn't because a TIF didn't happen either. They, could, oh, there were other dynamics. Using that example, though, you know, could we say, hey, this is a candidate for a TIF under these conditions? Uh, will it produce 100 fair wage jobs? I mean, is that done where you get that specific? Or well, are we not able to? Greenville just, uh, they're getting a, uh, Sinta's building a great big company on land that was TIF land in the village of Greenville. Yeah, they, so they're advertising that. You go up 
go up to uh, Wausau and uh, what's it? Cronenberg. Cronenberg's got signs along the highway. TIF land development available. They advertise it. So you can do that, but. I just wasn't sure if we could actually give, you know, that level of detail or specific. We've just done bonus points so far on that. Um, you know, you can certainly set development goals for different areas. Um, you could see, you could you could add you want minimum value for those areas. Um, now downtown redevelopment tiffs, it's a little different. Right. I, mean, <coughs> I still believe Marion Road, even though it hasn't financially been the success everybody hoped it would be, it has certainly achieved very good redevelopment goals, and and I would stand by that. Financially, eh. I mean, we, and we all know that. Um, for those areas along a corridor, you could say, you know, we want, you know, if everybody else is getting value of so many dollars per acre, we want something comparable to that. You could, you could do those types of things. Again, that's up to council. Um, acceptable IRR, I, I missed part of Frank's presentation, but, you know, some cities do require minimum IRR, but that minimum IRR is 12 to 15%. I, before I left, the question came up, well, should we raise that standard? If local developers are willing to take a minimal IRR, I don't necessarily if we should uh, tell them no. Now, do we want to be careful if there's a negative IRR? Yeah, I think we would want to because the, the likelihood of them succeeding is, is going to be minimal. But doesn't like seek like in that, it, you know, that kind of precedent setting for in terms of accepting those low IRR potentially higher risk than you invite others I can see the argument um, at the same time one of my points that I preface with is we have so many redevelopment needs and where do we get started and you're gonna get started when you're trying to climb your way you know, back out of a, a ditch, you got to start with riskier things. You got to take riskier steps. Now, you're going to fall, but if you fall, you're not going to fall as far. But, like, we just got this um, new uh, one on uh, TIP 33, and that one meets, like, phenomenal, I, I, in my view, um, standards. It, it seems like, you know, there, there's pretty a lot of public benefit here, a shorter amount of time, you know, as of 14 years, um, light elimination, job creation. I mean, it just, it's its almost like... Environmental remediation. Environmental too. remediation, yeah. exactly. I mean, this one looks, you know, very solid. Um, I'm just kind of wondering if we end up... Um, I, I, I guess you're right. We don't want to eliminate our flexibility but it just seems like, you know, we, we want to really recognize those that are solid and promote that, it, it seems to me. The, the IRR, we've got to be careful with that because if, if you accept a low IRR, you're by definition accepting a longer return. Mm -hmm. And will that help promote development in the area. If they're successful, that'll get somebody else that will get a higher IRR. And then somebody else will get a higher IRR. And then we get to the point where the IRR is so high that we don't need TIF. The question is, is how many TIFs do you have to do to get to that point where TIF is no longer necessary? Um, if, we're, if we're also deferring all that increment, Budget, budget times coming up here, and I'm just kind of curious, you know, Mark, what do you think in terms of if we didn't have this and those developments were happening without TIF, you know, if that magic land existed, let's say, would would we be able to do a lot more in terms of providing services, you know, to our citizens and our school and our county? I mean, I'm just giving you my I'm giving you my professional opinion. The tips we bring to you will not happen without assistance. They will take so long for anybody to even whiff at that, and, and then they're taking a huge chance 
and the risk of failure is even higher. That's why we recommend those ones. The ones we don't think are ever going to happen, and we've had, it's very difficult. You know, I, I'm very proud of my 30 years of experience, but the mayor has pointed out, I've never personally had to make a payroll. You make my payroll. I don't make it. So for me to have a discussion with a business person, telling them I think they have a, a bad business model, is a very difficult conversation to oh, have. I'm sure. Because I don't have that expertise. But I've seen successful projects, and I've seen failed projects. And there are people that come in, and they've got these stars in their eyes, and they got this great idea. At least it, it seemed to their friend over here at the bar. And they come in and they want to have this time. Just oh, poor Dave sitting next to me. But, but you're right. But but the idea. <laughs> but the idea is, there there are a lot of great ideas that people have that just don't have practical sense. You want them to succeed, and you want to be the have a reputation as a community that helps people succeed. Yes. People have got to make money. That's why we all do this. So the IRR thing is it's is just one component. We've been using it a lot lately because it demonstrates the risk associated with these projects and the need to get them off the ground. I would love to have these coming in with a 10% IRR and when they hit 15% <laughs> we can call it quits. We're not seeing a lot of those because the market here is still a tough market in terms of rentals. Even the, the market rentals are close to the, uh, the subsidized rentals. Is that a fair statement, Alan? Yes. <laughs> in terms of you're talking commercial, not residential. No, I'm residential. talking residential. The residential rate versus the low and moderate income rate. The rates are so close to one another. Um, we have a very small vacancy. We do, but that would, one could argue that they could raise the rents, but it's a soft high occupancy. I would, I would, I would. You're talking about ability theorize. to pay? Irrespective of whether it's offset or not, I, I think the market is is somebody builds something new, they're going to shift, and there's the, the need for rental housing in the in the community has risen since since 2008. We're growing, not a huge growth, but we're growing, but we're not growing on the single family residential side. We're growing on the rental side because, and it's it's not That's just because of the students. Trend, it's a national trend. It absolutely is, and with millennials, you know they they. they if they're not ready to sink roots in, they just come home for a while. Oh, okay. If we <laughs> sounds, me they've sounds never like we just get close. Oh, yeah. And some they never well, left. Guess, it doesn't. You know, the know. housing is growing in the surrounding townships. It's not growing in the city. Mm -hmm. And part of the idea is if we can get some of this going, that we will get people to return. Right. But they got to have that confidence that the the investment is going to hold or have a little increase. We don't talk about IRR with our own houses, but effectively we all want something comparable to an IRR because when we sell it, we hope to make a little more money. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, I think Mark, oh, Frank. I, I, I just want to address what Paul Mary said. Could you, for, the, for our studio audience. Studio so, audience. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> They've gone to bed. Um, I just wanted to address your, your point about can we make some of this uh, revenue available for other programs and I'd like to go back to the charts that John had earlier in particular the one about the base value and then the tax increment that's generated yep. um, during the course of the the time that the TIT is outstanding that base value those taxes still go to those entities as is mm -hmm. but when you provide the additional value tax increment when that tax increment district is done all that goes to the community so these TIFs pay for themselves during the period, or the TIDs pay for themselves during the periods that they're in existence. But when the TID is closed, you've created that additional value, all that additional value, and then that goes back into the community. So in that respect, that's what we try to look for as well, is how will this create, not only to pay back the TID, but overall benefit to the community in that respect. And I, I would agree with you. Um, however, what I was seeing from what I got from the assessor's office, at least in recent and properties that are potential to um, it seems that we set our base value so low and and that frequently they're like less than half of what they might have been you know previously when they were active so I guess you know yes it freezes it and there is some coming in 
but then we're also looking at that whole you know if if it if we're going to the max and again i'm not anti-tiff i voted for tiffs i'm just looking at you know where are our opportunities to tighten things up in terms of are there but fours maybe they wouldn't happen without the tiff but they still would happen even if it was shortened or if it was for less money so that's kind of you know where I'm mm -hmm. and that's the gap that we try to identify with every yes. project and that takes you down the whole so. net operating income and IRR yep. discussion yeah. yeah. Ellers take a look at yeah so our, this has our, been great this is our, awesome. our challenge is balancing between IRR and life it's not minimize the life because you minimize the life you're you were shoving the IRR down. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to. I thought no, that that's okay. No, that was good because I was going to go to the, the slide. So. I was going to ask Kelly to go for, for the, one of the last things I was going to say. This is slide six. We go to slide ten because John um, talked about this a little bit. A lot of the details in terms of eligible costs are right here on this page, and the details go into the development agreement. And when the TIFs approved. The development agreement is still the real key to how this all works. How much? How much do they get? What will be you know? What will be the the number of years that they'll get? Um, the, all those details are are really embedded in here because this is what staff looks at when we're getting into eligible project costs. These are the things we take a look at. What do they need? Um, you know, infrastructure is is obviously the probably the, the top of the food chain in terms of what are the most appropriate <coughs> expenses uh, because that's putting money back into the community um, but it's extraordinary costs and I you know I use the arena as one example because uh, the extraordinary costs of development uh, in the case of uh, the Lamico that's just been proposed because they didn't want to be part of the original TIF they've got a lot of environmental remediation those are extraordinary costs because they now because of the proximity of the university they wouldn't necessarily go somewhere else but if they're looking around the university why would they pick a contaminated site um, well they pick a contaminated site because there's very few options and then the incentive helps them make the difference between it being a good deal and being a not so good deal so, so Mark then on our look back safety there um, so would we if we look at our list any, anything 10 years let's say would be so to 21 through number seven if I'm looking at that right because the all the pink ones were closed yeah. so would have we already done our look back on so, to 21 they weren't pay, they weren't all pay gold because right? and, and that goes back to the statement I made before I rushed out was we are always looking for trends to to protect ourselves better or to make be more successful and the look back is a more recent trend um, and you know we probably heard it for the first time at an Ellers workshop I don't want to do a commercial for them but I mean that's what you know they're they're at the Lee conference and they're at the city manager conference and the planners conference and the finance conference they're constantly educating people on those things and look back provisions um, became I mean, an issue. I think the first one would have been, I think, I believe, look back at the first one would have been best list. Okay, so 25. Or there, or some, it, or that may not even, it might have been well, after. I'd have to look that one up if that even had a look back. But uh, definitely. We cap the dollar amount that they could receive. Right. But. And that's another way to do so it. So that would yes. be, but it would be, look back would only be in the last several years. Yes, okay, right. so like mm -hmm. 2014 with the pay go on the north. Uh, industrial that's yes, probably that the first one we did. but okay. to that point every year in the budget you put those tips in the budget plan yep. talk about them we're kind of doing a look see or you're doing a look see to how they're doing performing so if there is some changes and things that could be done or need to be done we can address them at that time Absolutely. even though they don't have a specific look back Kind of a report. look back. Yeah. It's a review. A it's yearly a review, review of our tips. Exactly. I almost call it a report card. How's it doing? Yeah. Compared to expenses and projected uh, revenues. So that we have some some opportunity to, if we would have to go back, we could maybe do that during the. I, I thought we couldn't contractually unless we had that in there, though. 
uh, we can once we for the the tips that prior to look back there's a dollar amount you'll see when the dollar amount would be reached gotcha. then we could okay. close it yeah. okay unless there's other project costs we're paying so our for. first really look back if you will then would be coming up in like 2024 if, if, uh, guys court. Number or for, for Bemis. For Bemis. Bemis, North Industrial yeah. Park, number two. That's probably right. The idea, but I think what you're finding is you're having this discussion is that's not necessarily what you're talking about here. You're talking about when you decide to do public works and, or uh, cash grants, what are the terms under which you're going to do it? And those are the things that... Um, that we follow the best practices and we also keep the creativity like everything that Kelly showed you there is a different med method to every TIF because you're looking for what do they specifically need and how can we close that gap each owner is different each project's different but yeah. vertical cost you know the building to make the project have greater return I mean that's we're doing some of that right now this Cash grants are essentially, when you say vertical, they're actually building the building. It's not just doing some site prep or remediation. You're actually building the building. And that's probably the toughest one of all for any council, not just this council, any council would do because you're actually giving cash in a developer's pocket, but without that cash, and that's where the IRR analysis comes in, how much is, how much is too much, um, Unfortunately, our returns are just not that good that we haven't reached a point of it being too much. I would love to get there because eventually then we say TIF's not necessary. Mm -hmm. But we still have a, a we still have a road to, to climb up on that. I had um, a question. Um, you said that the beach in Washington building wouldn't have happened without historic assistance, the tax credits. Why wasn't the granary? Why didn't they go after the historic tax credit? They couldn't. Because they had a low IRR. That, that, uh, no, no, it was it had no. nothing to do with the IRR. It's because they were not uh, designated one of the nationally recognized historic buildings. So you have to get on the national register. Oh, you got to be on that first. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and they and cool. they could, and they weren't, I guess, unique enough to qualify because they did try to. There was a problem with the term granary versus mill. Oh. They'd call themselves the Villery, probably would have had a better shot, but they didn't go with it. That was the problem. And so even we those locally landmarked it, is what I remember, for the yes. Landmarks Commission. So yeah, two years. wasn't the first, the, when they originally developed, I mean, was there the uh, district? Landmark, uh, the historic historical district? credits at that time? I mean, homes can get granary. Okay. When it was, do you mean when it was originally right. repurposed? Oh, no. First, first, yeah. That's 20 some years. Couldn't tell you. I don't know. I thought there, there, was, there was some. Mm. But you can see that each one has its own formula for success, and that flexibility <coughs> is, is important. But the details really do come in with the development agreement. And when we approach it, we're trying to figure out what's the thing that makes us successful. Um, we also look for how much can we limit that because we're trying to limit it. We, our goal is to try to get it back on the tax roll as soon as possible. The, the, the slide, slide six that Frank had shown, the whole idea is when, it ha when we start to break down that district, then we all reap the great benefits. TIF seven is gonna add 200, almost $200 million to our value. And that's gonna be great for the county, the school district, everybody. Um, that's what so our goal is to get that to happen as soon as possible but we also have to balance it with we want to make sure the project's successful so that at the end of the TIF the project's still alive and <coughs> doing well for the community so those are the challenges um, and you know we can present options for council and it's just more a comfort zone do you want to be that restrictive do you want to restrict yourselves or your future councils to that. And that's a that's a policy call that you as a group will have to make. Each of you have your own individual thoughts on that, but collectively you're gonna to have to come up with one and there's the fun part. <laughs> and and we, we could make a decision to change policy at this point. Next year, another council could be seated with. But it, what it comes down to is it's, it's the people sitting on council that are gonna be making the decisions. They're gonna work, they're, they, hopefully will take all of the information that's presented to them 
and to make the best decision for the community. And there is no, there's no sure thing. In theory, everything <coughs> works. It's in the application that things get weird. Question about the, about the scoring system? Sure, because yes. my presentation's over, so I just, I, I, just, I want to oh, give good. you the signal. Let's go for it. Yeah, please, um, Dave. Is um, the, the, when it was brought up about um, quality of jobs and looking at this at, with Lamico, and I understand that, that Lamico is a, a different type of project, a different type of project. It was a, not only a blighted project, but it was also uh, residential. It was, pe was people-based, uh, not employment-based. But how, do you, is this the one size the, the one criteria, or do you have a different criteria for industrial as opposed to commercial? <coughs> Talked about that. Okay. Yes. That, did I miss that? We developed one for industrial and one for redevelopment or rehabilitation blight project. So we've got two, and Mr. Roloff is saying we actually probably need three okay. because we didn't we don't have right. a mixed use mm -hmm. criteria. Okay, and, and, and so the. the um, Historical preservation, for instance, or, or jobs may be rated differently in those. Yes, the industrial rate. For an industrial one, you may not do it at all. That's right. You may yeah. put no points on something like that. And jobs in an industrial TIF, the jobs should be a much higher standard versus a hotel. I mean, when you're doing hotels, you know what you get. Um, and that's not bad. It's just that from a redevelopment standpoint, the Best Western's fantastic. And we could assign different terms or different scoring weights for those various categories and once you decide to go that route you are effectively saying you want separate criteria <coughs> otherwise you just have one but it, even for example if it was you know redevelopment versus industrial we could say okay with redevelopment it needs to be you know x number of years you know max of the stone i mean there are any number of ways that we could go but again it's that real fine line of whether or not you're going to take away some of the flexibility and the incentive components because it is our only it is our only bullet to use it's our biggest bullet i would give you there there are other bullets that we have but the it's biggest. definitely the biggest the the other thing that i, w I would want to throw in that we haven't talked too much about and maybe jason talked a little bit about it at the beginning about economic development is developers or businesses like to have some kind of idea of the timeline and certainty and if they go through the process they're looking at a bunch of different locations and other communities and the better we can perform the more we stand out the higher the likelihood is we're going to attract that capital or that investment and I, I, I want you to also keep that in mind because there's always the economic development hat that we all wear. I guess my comment is and I've stayed quiet um, but I don't think tonight the conversation is over. I think this is a part, I think this was good education for a lot of people. I hope, hopefully the public, we also have some newer council members. And I think that's very, I think that's very helpful. Um, but I think there's some things that I think through the direction and the thought processes of us on council um, is that I think we definitely need to have another follow-up meeting because you know, part of the reason why we focus so much on this type of TIF with redevelopment actually came from our strategic plan starting back in 2012. Mm -hmm. So because, you know, at that time the Pioneer was deteriorating, we had the hotel, we had the buck staff, we had a lot of things going on in Central City. So it was very applicable at the time. And I'm not saying that that job is over. However, I think we also can't focus so much on this that we lose sight of the bigger picture, which is the economic development and the TIFs that are for companies and what can we do? And that's to the discussion that I had that I wanted you and I to meet with Jason White so that we can start to have those discussions. Is it appropriate to start to lead instead of being knee jerk reaction when it comes to TIFs? Because if we want those higher rents in order to be able to make these TIFs right now that are considered risky successful we have to figure out how we're going to then have tips tips that are specific 
to drawing in those companies for those jobs, for those sustainable wages, to raise that because that's what we're consistently hearing right now. Well, we have to have this, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it's factual, we have to have this because Oshkosh can't get the same rent as Madison or this community or that community. Well, then it's also our responsibility on council to work with staff and our stakeholders to make sure we're developing a community that then people, other communities are saying, well, we can't get the rents they're getting in Oshkosh, because isn't that the overall goal? Mm -hmm. Yes. What a comment. Yeah, you know, and, and to, to dovetail with that, not only do we have to work with our partners locally, but we also need to work with our, our, our governmental partners. Mm -hmm. And it was brought up the fact that Fond du Lac has instituted a sales tax at the county level to facilitate economic development. Sales tax in Winnebago County is a dirty word. Mm -hmm. Now, if you flip that and say in an, a, an economic development investment source and then truly put it to work, that could make a world of difference related to things like this that we would get people there. And I'm sure Mr. White would like that bullet in his uh, cartridge so you know it's not just working with our local par our partners but we got to reach out to those other people fully understanding it. it's not just going to facilitate not just going to help Oshkosh it's going to be throughout the county level but we can begin that discussion as well and that's, that's just what I'm saying because you know I I stand by my tiff regarding the granary we talked about development south of the bridge and that came up bef uh, when we were getting everything together for the hotel. Um, who would have thought the Buckstaff property would come down in a short period of time, we would have something else you know, coming into place. Um, and I think too, I think Frank may have mentioned it, which in my, in my terms, some of these low risk tips in areas that we're trying to get, you know, build some momentum, gain some momentum, I look at it as strategic risk. Um, but again, you know, the, conver the conversation isn't over, I think, I think the TIF policy that we currently have, again, goes back to where we were in 2012 and 2014 and even 2016. But I think as we next year will be strategic planning again, a year from July, pick August or February, I don't care, don't pick a summer month. But, um, you know, I think we really have to look at what we re we have to reevaluate what is the direction of the city again and how much emphasis needs to be placed where. Right. I totally agree because really the only only one we got now would be the aviation industrial park that could create some of those jobs you're talking about but we also made that very limited to what can go in there so you know I think we need as many bullets in our gun Brown County was another you know council member Peck mentioned the sales tax Brown County is using it again to their advantage incorporating a whole bunch of communities for rehabilitation of their expo center and you know, putting limits on it and things like that. So we, we have to work with what we have, but at the same time, we need to be starting to think outside the box of where can we go and be more creative so that we can bring in those companies and corporations and grow our, our tax base. Well, this has been really good information and very professionally done and comprehensive, so thank you. Okay, I think that's, okay. that is uh, almost a quarter of nine. We've had a very, very good workshop. I want to thank Frank and John from Ellers, thank city you, staff, Jason. This is a lot of work. This was long overdue for the council, both for newcomers and some of us veterans. So, I know. Thank you a great deal. Mm -hmm. Okay.